Hello and welcome to the second Understanding Class live stream. We've got a full group here today. Let's go through. Starting bottom left, we got all the way from Utah. Derek, how's it going? I'm okay. I just uh, I'm hanging out with my my dog and. Um, oh yes. Yes. Uh, Can we see look at this dog? dog? Your dog looks really old. My dog is not really. My dog is like four years old, but. My dog is uh, also lazy and doesn't want to come to me right now. Um, and uh, I have Good a, dog. I have a, 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 a uh, basset hound, uh, something else mix. So short, stocky, quiet. Is it a rescue? Yeah, it's a rescue from Oklahoma. So. Why did you have to go all the way to Oklahoma? Is that not I didn't. Way? That's where they go to get the basset hounds. Apparently, there's just packs roaming basset hounds in Oklahoma. Seriously. I'm I am only I apparently um apparently actually they just don't have enough money to fund their shelter so everybody goes down there to get dogs you, um in the west um so yeah I guess I mean Oklahoma barely has a government. So like Is Oklahoma uh, the one that's like now technically run by one of the native tribes? That's mis that's a misallocation of what that actually means. Like they've been given back some tribal control over about a fourth of the land. Oklahoma originally though was where they forced all the native tribes to go. Is what it was founded for was like the great, the great. We're gonna put all the natives there and you know make them subject dependent nations. Which you know anyway. I, I don't need to go over the history of the Native American legal status before we start talking about class because you want to talk about some sad shit related to class, but um. But that yeah, the, the uh, Oklahoma's Oklahoma's up there with like um, Wyoming and the Dakotas and places with like basically kind of have a government, but not really. Um, so, um, so, what, so what you're saying it'd be really easy to run a bunch of communists there and fuck things up. Here you. The, the militia movement already has had that idea and has done it a couple times. Well, there. Speaking, so of, there. speaking of communists and dogs, I was in uh, Bucharest a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago. And um, I don't know if you know, like the second biggest building in the world at the time was after the Pentagon was this palace that Ceausescu built. Oh, yeah, that that place. It's like this big, brutalist nightmare building. It's it's unbelievable. It's it's like it's absolutely genuinely amazing. And he knocked down like uh like a quarter of the old city or half the old city just so he could have like a Champs Elysees coming out of this. So he basically destroyed all this like amazing like 12th century like city center so that he could build this big Champs Elysees. And all the people that were living in those areas, they basically they had to get rid of their dogs because they were going to be put into high rise flats. So they literally, they either had to kill their dogs or they had to basically let them go wild. And so this is like maybe 15, 20, 30 years later, there's still wild, packs of wild dogs roaming around Bucharest. I was going to like the off license to buy a few beers and I came back and like a pack of these like wild dogs was on the street. It's like 20 or 30 wild dogs on a street of all different types. Man, I shit myself. It was about the, the year before I was there, like some Japanese tourists got like attacked by a pack and killed. They literally bit his neck open. Wow. Yeah. So there's a big rest dogs. Carcesu really had it coming. He, he really had it coming. Man, he had it coming. You want to see that? That building is amazing. Like they're still finishing it. Every single, every single thing in the entire building, it is massive, right? They think they won't even say how many floors deep it is. They reckon it's a, it's seven or eight floors deep, and uh, that's kind of national security stuff. But the 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 entire building was built from uh, Romanian uh, raw materials and production, except for the hand dryers in one of the, in the toilets. And for something like ten years, twenty five percent of the Romanian GDP was this building. 25% of GDP. And they're still trying to finish it 20 years later. My uh, God. Can't argue with the results. Romania, Albania, all those fun countries. Um, 
Man. What uh, I say? Yeah. When anyway. you try to outdo Stalin, that's what happens. <laughs> yeah. Probably, is it Stalin or is it like, I think he was trying to outdo like the, uh, the North Koreans. It was the North Koreans that he really, he went to North Korea like in the 60s and went, oh, uh, I like this. <laughs> you know, that's apparently oh, true. I think that's right. Yeah. Um, so who do we have then? Kyle in Canada. How's it going, Kyle? All right. Um, yeah, we've, we've, I mean, just like everyone else, uh, we've gone through a cold snap here uh, lately, but uh, we're doing okay and giving lots of food to the birds so that they don't freeze to death. Um, uh, Good. Yeah. The Thames, parts of the Thames froze over for the first time in like 50 years uh, the last week. Yeah. So well, that photo of all those poor people, it was in Glasgow out on the food line on the on the on the food line for like uh like a food uh what was it uh food bank soup kitchen or something right yeah. they're all lined up in the snow yeah it was yeah. minus they had the, the the coldest temperatures in 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 scotland for like was it 30 years in minus 23 or something that's pretty right. cold Celsius, yeah that's pretty cool yeah yeah um out here in the west actually we we're we're experiencing a a warm snap that we've been experiencing for two months and we're not going to have any water in the summer. And if you guys thought last year's fire season was going to suck, you haven't seen anything. Yeah, um, I, I, I know it's, it's weird. I think we must be on the border zone in Alberta because we did get a big cold snap and lots of snow just at the end. But before that it was, it was warm and no snow for like months and months and months. Yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't. I don't understand. I don't get. I. I think Derek, you're full of it. Everybody knows that global warming is a local phenomenon, and here it's quite cold. That's just the way it is. Moving yeah, on. Yeah, you've, you've, you've neglected to mention the space lasers. You know the you Jewish. Know the Jewish space lasers. Let's get it well, right. I didn't need to say that because everything I say, you could just put Jewish in front. Of. But like in when fairness, I say communism, like. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's just like I, I I actually got a chance to to say Jewish space lasers there. I'm going to take it. That's all I'm saying. So are, are we are I'm, we two fifths Judeo Bolshevik conspiracy? Um, well, I suppose Judeo Menshevik conspiracy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Judeo Councilist conspiracy. Judeo nonconformist <laughs> communist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've always so, considered myself Jewish for some reason. I don't know why. I just. <laughs> I, I was such a big Woody Allen fan for a while. Oh, no. Oh, no, Tom. Yeah. Oh, no, Tom. That would make you not just Jewish, but other things. Yeah, uh, Jewish. Does yeah. that mean that you're a British <laughs> Israelite? Because that's not a good thing. Well, um, Irish. <laughs> there wasn't too, there's not too many Irish Jews left, apparently. Yeah. Shit. They got... Um, there was, it, there was, to, there was Jewish pogroms. In, there was Jewish yeah. pogroms in Ireland in the 30s. Yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah, wow. yeah. In Limerick, uh, well, yeah, that, not murders, but they were run out of Limerick, apparently. Who the fuck was the IRA there? Do, wait, don't tell me. I mean, the Catholic Church were involved. The Catholic okay. was like a bishop was like riling everybody up against the Jewish communists, <laughs> uh, but who had close links, I think, to the brown shirts or whatever. Yeah, so there you go. That's Irish history for you. Um, you think we would get away with not having anti-Semitism without having actually really any Jewish population? But no, we stepped in there, making making everybody proud, huh? That didn't stop early Tsarist Russia, which also didn't have Jews, but was weirdly anti-Semitically obsessed. Did it not have Jewish people in? The, in the Jewish population in Russia is late because it's it, basically after yeah. they get kicked out of Germany. You kicked out of Germany so many times to go to Poland, they get kicked out of Poland. Uh -huh. They're like, well, shit, where else can we go? Um, let's go past Kazaria for once and go the and uh and they went into Tsarist territory, but there was there was anti-Semitic conspiracy theories back like pre um Ivan Dolferuski, which is Ivan Terrible, and there yeah. really weren't Jews there. Like yeah, it it was all from like canon law obsessions. They're like, Well, you know, this third this third century Greek guy had a problem with Jews, so we got to. So like Damn. Talk about like keeping a beef alive that you aren't really involved yeah. with. Jesus. Yeah, it's true. I just can't stand these Berbers, you know? God damn it. 
That's the, yeah, that's the equivalent. That is if, the I ever, if I ever see a Canaanite, <laughs> let me tell you. I'm telling you, they're getting it. Those Samaritans. Apparently, there is like still about 200 Samaritans left. Yeah, their the, their re religion. They have their own Torah. They have a slightly variant version of Hebrew. Like mm. they're protected by the Israeli state. They had their own cool mountain. Wow. Are they not in so, Syria? Yeah, like 300. Yeah, the uh, Mount uh, Mount Gerashim um, yeah. is their mountain, and mm. they, they still hang out wearing their white stuff and following their even stricter version of Sabbath. They're not allowed to have fun. Oh. So you're not allowed to podcast on the Sabbath? No. No podcasting. You know, you can podcast, but you can't write. But I thought you what? can't use electrical. You can't use electricity. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. You can't turn on electricity. If the electricity is already on, you can use it. Oh, uh, that's such a cop. Are you telling me? Are you telling me that I don't need this Shabbos Goy to unmute and mute my microphone all the time? All right, Shabbos Goy, get yeah. out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, and and to think. Oh my God! Talking about lawyers, my God, that's a lawyer there. It, it is a lawyer religion. <laughs> oh my God, that's worse than like I was telling you about the uh, Catholic one. Is it? Uh, um, what's that one where they can? The, the, there is a technical way you can tell lies in, 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 in under Catholicism, where you can, and they use it in like all the child abuse ones. Where oh yeah, like, yeah you were talking about this before. Yeah, yeah, oh. and they say it's and there's a there's a reservation, mental reservation is what they call it. It's like, well, I mentally reserved <laughs> when I told you the, the lies there by Kitty Fidlin. Yeah. Is that like, is that like the sh uh, the sh the the Shiite uh, takia where you can lie if it's protecting the name of the prophet or whatever? Uh, like, I think it's a lot more broad. <laughs> it's just literally. <laughs> it's just like you don't even have to you be can lie. Jesus. You just got to figure out. It's just like I. Yeah. I kind of like it when you guys just have to go do like a bunch of B play for a week whenever you do something bad so yeah the old catholics well, on their anal b play that's them all right <laughs> no I, I will say we've reached a whole new low and that our intros have gone through 12 minutes into the intros and i don't even think there's two of us you haven't even mentioned yeah oh well i've uh, the tiberius let's go tiberius this is tiberius's first <laughs> day here uh tiberius how's it going uh you know it's pretty good Pretty good. Recently moved into a new place and uh, still dealing with like setup and stuff like that. But this is a nice house and I have internet connection, which like wasn't yes. true for the past like 15 years. So what, what, what do you mean? You have no internet connection. Uh, yeah, I can't. I live like kind of out in the sticks. So I, I literally just didn't have an internet connection at my house. It, it was just my phone. Americans have the worst internet, I'd say, in the developed world. I, for yeah, sure. absolutely, for sure. Like I was off on like a, like a, island off the west coast of Ireland, like with, you know, two hundred people on it, and they were getting connected up to fiber optic, and they already had broadband. You know, <laughs> we, we're, we're getting, getting super fast. They're getting like a hundred megabits per second. We're getting like uh, they, they put like I had to upgrade my my email my my email my my uh, fuck internet. Um, yesterday because I've, I've been slowing down on upload speeds and then like I saw that they finally they're putting in Google Fiber next week in a major metropolitan area like we're just now getting it um, so yeah our internet blows and what, having lived in South Korea which objectively has the best internet in the world for three yeah. and a half years when I came back to America I was like throwing my computer I yeah. mean <laughs> uploading videos is not something you want to be doing on crap raw brand It'll take it really isn't. four hours to upload a one hour video. It's totally insane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I live, I, I used to live half a mile away from the, the border of a town of like 24,000 people. So like I say, I lived out in the sticks, but it was only like relative, right? Yeah. 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 Well, my folks live three miles from the nearest town. That's 1000 people put into perspective. Yeah. In the middle of a bog and they got super fast. Yeah. yeah. Oh God. Oh god! Uh, that's that bog fiber. <laughs> bog fiber, yes. <laughs> it's it's a bog standard internet connection, right? Bog standard, yeah. That's <laughs> <it's, it's> way <laughs> above our average. That bog standard is like. Well, you see, you know, we've screaming. had uh, we've had Star Trek Discovery with their mycelium drive. We have our mycelium <laughs> computer networks out in the bogs. You just stick it straight into the ground, fucking ace. 
<laughs> but you need your uh, you need one person in the family to have a mycelium interface. Mm. Uh, yeah, sp- yeah, you gotta in- in- install the mushroom chant on your mushroom your chant. I remember Finally, why mold computing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. In 2011, I remember in in Korea, you could go out to the countryside, and there was more 4G than there was toilets. So, like a lot of places didn't have modern plumbing, but they had 4G. Yeah. Um, that's a strong, a strong capitalist state for you, huh? Versus the free market, uh, a planned capitalist state. Um, finally, Esri. Has hello, gone. hello. I have a have a, a wine hangover, and I'm uh, just on my my like third cup of coffee here. Everything's great, doing good, ready to talk class. Let's do it. Let Let's me do see it. if I. Let's get Third it up cup here. of coffee. That's Mormon edgy. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. It's hot. It's a hot drink, people. It's a hot. It's, it's a hot drink of caffeine. Because a cold drink of caffeine is okay, but a hot drink is not. Is a hot drink of no caffeine okay? Yes, like they can chocolate? have hot chocolate. Oh, like they have the really fuck? good hot chocolate here because Mormon and and Postum. Which if you've never <laughs> had Postum, don't worry about it. It's a it's a chicory based coffee substitute because their life is huh. that sad. It's um, like carob <laughs> chips. Okay. Seriously, we're going to be start talking about pimmican soon. Fuck's sake! <laughs> no, there's one thing I must say. I was in the I was in the shop the other day. I was looking at buying some chocolate, and it struck me. I, I forgot how bad American chocolate was. American chocolate has got to be the worst chocolate. Nope, it gets in worse. The Asian chocolate's way worse. It's oh, way yeah. worse. Asian uh, chocolate is like pure carob and wax. It's like <laughs> I don't know. It's like. Can, there is no excuse. Like not all. Not, you're not into that. Uh, into that Ghana, Ghana chocolate. What's that? Oh, it's a it's brand Korean, in Japan. It, 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 it's a Japan. It's a it's a Korean and Japanese brand, and it's it's foul, Kyle. Why dare how dare you bring that up? <laughs> <laughs> it's traumatizing. I bit into that once, th- like thinking it was regular chocolate because I missed it so bad, and I was like, ugh. I, I like being never, offered coffee I can, while in India. Don't accept. I, I, I can never live. In, I just learned I can't live in whole chunks of the world. This is devastating. I'm kidding. I couldn't live there anyway. Mexico has really good chocolate. Moving on. Um. <laughs> yes, back to the text after 20 minutes. Okay, let's we hit never it. got to the text. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Last week, we went through um, the kind of stratification stuff. Uh, so we, we're, our first chapter is towards an integrated analysis. We're going to look at the stratification stuff, which we've done, and then we're going to get into the Weberian class hoarding and finally deal with Marxist exploitation and domination. So let's hit it in here. Let me see. Where did I leave off? Um, so we've got class as opportunity uh, hoarding. So this is kind of essentially Marx Weber type stuff. So this, uh, let's have a look here. If a job confers high income and special advantages, the holders use various means to exclude others from access to these jobs. It calls this social closure. Uh, I thought it was interesting. He talks about citizenship's rights, citizenship rights as a special and potent form of license to sell one's labor in a particular labor market. Like that, in America, that seems to be particularly a important type of social closure it's, yes it's, it's in a lot of places i mean i don't know yeah. about like if you're not an eu citizen it's pretty big in europe too having tried to get a job there um and it's it's damn near impossible in certain places like uh in east asia if you're not a citizen you your legal status is is severely curtailed as far as jobs go yeah um, they uh in, in Japan, they uh, specifically uh, fought the American occupation authorities on uh, making sure that uh, non-citizens would have uh, no special legal protections under the post-war constitution uh, because, uh, you know, they had a history of uh, exploiting lots of Korean immigrant labor. Uh, and I suppose, uh, you know, it was a big deal. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, that's kind of a thing that always like freaked me out living there. I was like thinking like, yeah, like I really have any rights actually 
Like I just, I'm just kind of here at the the pleasure of the state. <laughs> yeah, it was like that. Um, it was like that in uh, Korea as well. Although they were beginning to give us some legal rights, like for example, the English translation of your contract had to be legally the same as the Korean one that you signed. That they didn't tell you it was what it was. Um, the, that was a thing when I first went there. Well, it's like. Uh... Was that didn't the British do that to the Maori in New Zealand? They made them sign like an English version that said something different yeah. than the Maori one, and they're yeah. like, "Oh, well, you signed the document, bozos." Well, that happened. That, that happened with Indigenous people, like all the time, quite a bit. But but that became but that did become a legal controversy in uh, in New Zealand because you know which okay we're gonna do the letter of the law which law you know like which contract are we going to zero in on because they're two different contracts. And, and, and which one, Esri? Let me guess. The, Ma the Maori one won out in court? Yes, dear. <laughs> okay. Pat, Pat, Pat. Pat. Yeah, you know, I was I interesting. Yeah. I was, no, I was I, just, I, I just going to say, like, I think the... Um, it's interesting because my instinct here was that, like, that uh, it was more of a thing that was important in the, in the Western countries as a way of kind of controlling, like, immigration, you know, economic immigration. But if you go to... Like I remember being in, in, in Uganda and they have very, very strict ownership rules uh, over land and stuff like that. They, like say as a you know a European or something, you can't go in there and buy land. You yeah. can only own like up to I think 49% of any piece of land. You have to get a local person to co basically sign it. So it's it's not just a simple like first world thing, it's also used by you know developing world or the global south to try and keep out you know, uh, global capital, you know, kind of exploitation to some extent. Yeah. Highly used in that, in those contexts actually, and, and more restrictively so. Um, but um, it, it tends to, however, not stay just to fight again, because eventually what happens is um, class labor with people with higher educational status are needed and that locals can't get them. So they make exceptions for Westerners who they're trying to keep out, but then other poorer minorities from even more um, underdeveloped countries become a primary issue. So for like if, if as an American in Mexico, it was very easy for me to get a lot of perks that are legal, but you know, I can't own land. I technically can't own land in Mexico, but they would find like, yeah, but we have this lease where you can kind of own it for a hundred years and you'll be dead by the time you don't own it anyway. Um, whereas if I was Guatemalan, it would be a different story. So it starts off trying to trying to keep out, you know, the big bad imperialists, but it usually ends up being a way to keep even people in even uh, scarcer situations down. I think people often don't understand this too when it comes to like immigration from Central America, because Mex like getting through Mexico is brutal for a lot of those people, um, and the immigration regime there is almost as bad as anything in the United States in regards to that. And it's not an entirely dissimilar um, phenomenon that happened in Kashmir, uh, where basically like uh, property rights were restricted to to Kashmiris only, uh, predominantly to prevent the absolute economic takeover of uh, Kashmir by Indians. And part of the huge uh, deal last year, when when the Modi government basically ended the the special relationship status with Kashmir and uh, cut off their internet was essentially to uh, open up the the Kashmiri property markets to Indians in order to uh, in order to basically um, like provide That's primitive right. accumulation for Indian uh, capitalists and settler probably is it yes as well? uh, it was absolutely it's it's absolutely a settler colonialist project. You, it's funny you mentioned like India, like because I remember reading in the Economist magazine they were always given out about India, probably because it was such a massive market. They were saying Western capital, we can't go in. We can only be like a like a forty nine percent share in any country. They were given out about why Walmart can't get into India and all this kind of stuff. And you're like, fuck you, Economist, pieces of shit. Yeah, that was my analytical response. <laughs> but it is interesting where we're on this though how much um for example it's easier to get into china which is supposedly not a capitalist country on some of these capitalist grounds it is uh india um and i and the 
the ethnic the way this the way this opportunity hoarding is used actually as a settler thing um in places i think leftists don't study i mean um honification of a lot of the um a lot of the mountainous regions yeah west china um quasi mongolia and those areas um that that's uh, also follows the same patterns of you know, forcing open land acquisition, not even, you know, um, to private parties, uh, favoring them and economic deals and whatever that really actually, you know, increases the, the um, settlement of the area. And that's in a country with like official national recognition for 18 different groups. So um, uh, it's, it's, it's super common. And it's, it's something that when when people ask me um, why I think it's important for Marxists to understand Biberian class analysis is a lot of imperialism actually functions way more on Biberian lines than it than it even does the way we describe Marxist ones because not that Marx is in Marxism actually uh, doesn't hand it's not it more or less doesn't handle this it talks about imperialism but it doesn't Marx doesn't deal with legal structures and licensure in this way, except in a couple offhanded comments in the critique of the Goethe program. And um, it's, because it, it's not really part of his worldview. It's, it's, um, much, it's much more a focus on the exploitation in production and, and surplus, as opposed to the initial just exclusion. But he does deal with exclusion in, in capital. You know, like the clearances are essentially a Viberian part. Yeah. Um, I, I, I say that not to say that like he's a po like he wouldn't recognize this analysis because he clearly would have it just didn't come up in capital because it's not part of the, the the capitalist circuit except in the in the way that it's sometimes using primitive accumulation but it also I guess um, it's it's how labor aristocracy exists too and we right. think of labor aristocracy as just credentialing but it's also like. Anything that requires a license to do is an opportunity hoarding. Um, and there's good, re there's even good reasons to opportunity hoard because you like, you don't want every person who has a crack whimity to claim to be a doctor. So you limit the opportunity of people who don't have the education to do it. But there is a side note of, of that. And that's like, like um, the ADA in America has, are the, the American, is it, is it not the ADA, the American Dental Association, the What's the AMA? AMA the American yeah. Medical Association. Yeah, they're basically a glorified cartel. <laughs> I mean, like every um, in every nation, Derek. It's not just America. Every nation, the doctors are an organized cartel. Like not they're in Cuba. Yeah, not in Cuba. <laughs> <laughs> but they they do act as like in in Ireland and England and all these things. Like they act as a break on. They acted as a break on NHS. They act on as a real break in Ireland and getting an NHS equivalent going right. You know, they they really are they are one of the strongest, I would say, in nearly every nation. The um sorry, Derek, did I interrupt you slightly there? Um uh, talking about just uh, talking about like you don't want everybody to be a quack doctor. My mother has a bit of a quack doctor. She uh she recommends she reads she reads these things and then puts them gets other people to do them so our neighbor was this old guy who's like in his mid 80s and he had like really bad chill planes and she told him oh, i read somewhere that rubbing raw chilies on them is really good for them <laughs> and so he did he did it and like it was just it was sheer agony for about a week <laughs> oh, dear. i also oh wanted to focus on this part of opportunity hurting at the bottom here before we move on to the next one labor unions can also function as an exclusionary mechanism by protecting incumbents of jobs from competition by class outsiders. This is actually the key point in distinguishing um, industrial unionization models That's versus nice. guild unions, yeah. because yeah. guild unions function this way. And people get mad at me when I actually say that effectively about 50% of all unions that exist in the, in the West are guild unions by this category, yeah. because I, they, they exist to, I mean, Tap more in America makes it almost inevitable that like is it not more? Is it not it might, more? It's probably all of them, frankly. It's it's yeah, because like the the model of industrial unionization was all about uh for lack of a better term, the collective worker it was about the sort of like you know 
instantiated solidaristic uh, spirit and long-term instantiated class interests. Whereas like guild unionism is much more, has a much more imminent like uh, rationality to an employment situation. It's like, I don't want people to take my job right now. <laughs> and like, uh, if you think about the types of work in the United States that can maintain having labor unions, it's often because they don't try to set their sights on liberating the whole class. It's shitty, but it's just, well, it's, it's what it is. It's also legally under Taff Hartley. They literally can't right. set their sights on, on liberty. But I mean, yeah, they can't do wildcats. They can't do solidarity strikes. Right. Yeah. Well, the people do wildcats anyway. Those are always illegal, but like solidarity oh. strikes would become, if a, if a union endorses a solidarity strike, it can lose its union licensure. Right. So, um, I, and, and this is, I think why I actually think people underestimate this for the fact that a lot of workers in the U S have anti-union sentiment because they, because this was also used, um, in the early 20th century to keep, uh, racial relations kind of tense, um, because the unions often were racially exclusionary, um, and particularly before industrial unionization. So you get back to the Knights of Labor and like they were like cheerleading the Chinese massacres and shit. Um, like Potterly, like at first condemned it and then like when his own, he was the leader of the Knights of Labor and then later on was like, well, okay, yeah, technically killing Chinese people is bad, but you know, they were taking your job. So I'm going to split the baby. Um, yeah. <laughs> Literally. Um, <laughs> The uh, also here, like I don't know if we focus uh, actually really is on the emphasis on like property rights as a pivotal form of exclusion in capitalist society. Like I, I do think it's pretty interesting because that's the one besides like, well, that's the form of enclosure that Marx is like most interested in, and it is a part of his theory, and so it makes it not so much of a stretch to include other forms of social enclosure that aren't just property rights. Um, there is a debate between like sort of third worldists and classical Maoists. And one of the interlocutors is like, look, a job is not property. And in a certain respect, a job of course is, I don't know, in a literal respect, job is of course not property, but in opportunity hoarding, you can see conceptually why a job, people can be covetous of their job as if it were property. There can be a class system around you know, keeping other, keeping competition away from your job in a similar propertarian sort of way. It's not literal, but there is basis in Marxism from, you know, the property enclosures to analogize this class process. It's not it, like out of the spirit of Marx. And English right. it's, it's like in, in linguistics when you have like metaphorical extension of a of a word to to be used in different contexts, like because the uh, because property rights are so baked into the way that the culture functions and on a very sort of basic economic sense, like using those systems or patterns of thought and, and metaphorically extending them into other areas is kind of a, a natural thing that you would expect. So in in a proprietarian society, you would you would have people seeing basically everything that is uh, economically useful or important as some form of property, like you know, uh, bits on a computer and and intellectual property and these kinds of things are basically metaphorical extensions of real property into other aspects of of uh, social and communal life. Yep. I'm going to go full Marshall Solins on our ass and start talking about symbolic kinship again. No, let's go. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, I, I just have one thing to say about this, uh, this private property rights, uh, which is that, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot where the Marxist case is kind of a special case of the Weberian one, but it's also seems to sort of like, have outsized importance relative to its position there. Like there's some kind of weird categorization problem where it doesn't fit in uh, a subordinate position to the Weberian uh, categorization. 
yeah, even no. though it technically is. Well, yeah, like it. Well, you could say that the others are like it's the original sin, and that the you know that opportunity hoarding is all, you know. A, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, I think I think what's going to complicate is very old, right? Yeah. The the thing is the the it's the private property in the exclusive rights of private property at Clay's capitalist class society, because because for example. Opportunity hoarding in forms of rents is the basis of minor of minorial and feudal society, right? Like it, that's okay, how yes. it works. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I I, I misunderstood. I was talking more. Uh, yeah. No. I I think that's I think that's kind of fair. It seems to just be. I don't know. Yeah. It just seems to be like the uh, what would you say, like a supercharged instance of of it, which changes the whole dynamic of the system. Perhaps it's it is the... the base of it? Yeah, no, that, that's, no, that's yes. totally that's totally what entered my head, because I'm like, I still have the old historical materialist model plugged into my brain here, and it's like, it's hard for me to not think of the property you know, enclosure as the fundamental like class distinction in society, not to say there aren't other important ones, that's the whole point of this book, um, but like, this is the thing that makes different, you know, modes of production or whatever you want to call them different from each other is how like property enclosure works. Like who owns whom or who's allowed to own stuff or who in fact owns stuff. Yeah. How does land ownership yeah. work and how does land tenure work? And, and I mean, I will say this is where the, the classical Marxist modes of production get weird because when you try to apply yes. them to feudal societies, it's like, uh, yeah. there's like 50 here, not one. But <laughs> Yeah. No, a feudalism is in, in a way like harder to understand than like ancient societies by this metric. Uh, I just want to throw this out here because I think it's going to become a point of controversy, but um, I would say that the, the way we understand uh, Marxist, uh, or Marxist understanding of class or this kind of like special case of the Weberian understanding of class is probably in some kind of like weird dialectical superposition that is going to cause this entire uh, neat analytical framework to get really funky. Uh, uh, I, I think I think there is there's is, there's something weird about this that is going to make this uh, quite messy in the end. It does actually. When I talked to, I interviewed. Um, EO right, right, like in 2014 in the Infinite Loss interview that I keep bringing up. But the, he tried to explain his, the the way he drew out the the scale after adding all these things together because he had these early scales in his first book on class that like were very neat and parsimonious and symmetrical. And they were like, there's nine and there's this, 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 and there's these internal level. And he basically said that was impossible to do once he tried to reconcile this and he came up with like a 32 point asymmetrical grid kind of then. And then, you know, and he's like, he didn't, he told me he hadn't finished working it out when he wrote this book. And from what I can tell, he never did. He never finished working it out. I want to see that grid. Like, but he tried to describe it to a and I, and we were confused and lost. And we're like, I don't even know how to edit this because like, should I keep it in? Because I don't know that I could. But it was over the the fact that the Weberian becomes a special case of the Marxist, and the Marxist becomes a special case of the Weberian when you try it's to add It's dialectical! Oh! <laughs> Air horns. Boom, 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 boom. Dialectics. Yeah, no, no that's, that's, uh, that's essentially it. You know, the no, ninth yeah, place... Eric Olin Wright uh, diagram was used to direct a bunch of research. So I could only imagine the fabulous, complicated, like insane research that would have came out of that 32 place one. Well, the nine place real... A girl can dream. 
it gets it gets made fun of though by like MMTers and stuff. The nine place one because a couple of the categories really do seem like they're just there because you needed a companion category. They are like Seriously, if, that's just if you physics envy. Fucking no, if if envy. well, it's it's just a it's a consequence of you know letting the analytical kind of brain keep going without kind of like I don't know switching on and being like, does this category actually exist? You know because if you have like two axes and most of the categories exist, like you can just cross a couple off because they're logically tenable, but not realistic. Like you could do that if you wanted. Like I, I have a new, I have a new rule for this reading group series. You want to hear it? Every time we're on a, every time we're on a slide and somebody says the word dialectical, we move on to the next slide. That's Love how it. we, that's how we know. Fair, we're finished. fair, fair. Okay. We need a real air horn. I have to go. I have to get the dialectical air. <laughs> okay. Oh, as we said the word, we have to move on. <laughs> oh, we didn't even get to do this. No. no. Okay, let's not do it. Okay, uh, so we're on to the next slide. Class as opportunity hoarding. Okay, <clears throat> we got. Uh, let's see. We got the main difference between opportunity hoarding and the individual uh, stratification attribute mechanisms we did last time is. Dun, dun, dun. Firstly, opportunity hoarding means the economic advantages from being in a privileged, <coughs> excuse me, from being in a privileged class position are causally connected to the disadvantages of people excluded from those class positions. Marx. <coughs> <coughs> okay, and uh, secondly, simply the rich are rich in part because the poor are poor. Class struggle. <coughs> um, yeah. We're not even quite at class struggle yet. We're ju we're at a we're at the sort of this was I, this is what I learned class was before I got into Marxism, and it's just like a depressing. It's the sort of Foucauldian picture, actually, in a way. It's like this, this like people are poor because they are rich, but it's all so complex and woven together, and there's all these customs supporting it. So, orf. Like good good luck. Uh, you know, good luck with that. If you don't like this, well, you know, good luck with that. We, you don't actually get to an image of overcoming until we get to the next section. That's what yeah. I mean. Anybody, anybody want to talk on these two? We'll just go on. Well, I mean, what is interesting is is Weber into it. So, uh, the, one of the key points of Marxism is that economic um, divisions are relational. Like and Weber gets this in a way that other liberal um, class theorists just avoid. Um, I, but unlike unlike uh, Marx, production is not uh, the reason why. For example, when you look at Weber's special categories, it's because production isn't prioritized as the, as the primary generator of you know stuff. Um, and why you care about these other relations. Inst instead, Weber pr treats all relation at relational hoarding as equal, which, okay, <laughs> like, fine, but also that's not how we experience it in real life because someone having cultural capital over me like only means a whole lot outside of my ego if it also limits my ability to get stuff. So... Yeah, and 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 unless you're working on like the Mandalorian or something, what people think of you on Twitter doesn't really affect your job outcomes. That was very current. That won't edit well. Nope. Sorry. Too dear. current. Yeah. Too current. Okay, let's let's move on. We've had enough kind of talking about uh, Judaism to get into Zionism. Actually, you're going to get a channel banned. <laughs> I'm sorry. What what was that? <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Um, Class, moving on, without a dialectic. Class as exploitation and domination. Okay, who wants to take this one? Somebody want to take this one. Tiberius, welcome to the void. Okay, what am I, I don't know, I have no idea what I'm doing here. Neither do I. Okay. So, uh, class as exploitation and domination. That's, that's what we're talking about here. Yeah. Associated with the Marxist tradition of sociality. I don't think that, here's what I think they have to say this. Domination isn't associated with the Marxist tradition of sociology. Like it's, it's not brought up that much. It, oppression is, and later on, 
uh, EO, EOW will get into how oppression is actually different from domination. He used I, to call I, domination exploitation, like a like a different category of exploitation, and realized that he couldn't make it work. Yeah, who, when who, when who, he, did, who are you talking about? Uh, right, right, AO right. right. Yeah, yeah, I, can, I, can read, I can read this passage where he gets into this. Uh, so he says, um, uh, both domination and exploitation refer to ways in which people control the lives of others. Domination refers to the ability to control the activities of others. Exploitation refers to the acquisition of economic benefits from the laboring activity of those who are dominated. Yeah, so he goes he gets into this the difference between say like a a prison guard who dominates you but doesn't earn from your exploitation and you know say like you know your owner who or even even let's get let's get you know your manager <laughs> you know on some level uh, uh <clears throat> gets not economic benefits from dominating you in the workplace. So that's his distinction I think. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And it's and what, I, it's, yeah. It's one that's interesting because conflating um, a domination and exploitation is what people do in this PMC thesis crap. Um, yeah, I remember. I, I couldn't tell if somebody was joking last time, but someone thought in the chat thought it was very problematic that Eric Olin Wright didn't think that prison guards exploited prisoners. And it's like, no, no, no. They don't exploit prisoners. They dominate them. And it's like very important to understand what the difference is and conflating these categories turns your brain to mush. Like, I guess I would push back that the Marxist tradition doesn't have this in it because the Marxist tradition has this whole theory of, you know, state capture and instituting class dictatorship. Um, and while it's not like, while a lot of Marxists don't think about how this would actually structure class on the everyday level, some of them did. And like, certainly whatever, like, bong rip post Althusserian circles that Eric Olin Wright was in before he went analytical. I think they probably did. And um, Derek, can you explain what you meant there about the the PMC analysis? Uh, the, PMC these two the, bits? The, the PMC treats the, the PMC analysis, which treats the PMC as a class, sees the primary focus of the PMC is domination of the economy. This is actually going all the way back to the to the MC theory of James Burnham, um, which was a repudiation in Burnham's mind of Marxism. I, I, where, I do say domination, Derek, in the in the sense that they dominate the direction, but not they dominate the, the direction and they dominate the and they, they dominate the political manifestation. They quote manage I mean the professional managerial class is it's it, it's actually these motherfuckers and i'm going to call them i'm i'm not going to miss words um are beginning to use this theory by aaron white to move between three different notions of class at the same time so you have this management who dominates management who dominates society because the exploitation is all hidden and diffused through capital ownership um which is some degree even true but marx and Engels had already predicted that that was going to happen um, the, the idea that the PMC are the primary class of society because the, the bourgeois are no longer actually in control because production really doesn't matter is also conflated in this. Although none of the people who, who invoke this actually admit that's what they're arguing because it would mean they're no right. longer Marxist and they're trying to claim to be Marxist at the same time. And say, then, sorry, and Derek, then you, say, you say that the production no longer matters what, because you know, because what, what, we because the production is outsourced in the economy in such a way that it is ba they don't say why actually they don't they don't know why yeah this, yeah, was, okay. this was the subject of uh we did a, a swamp side episode on the managerial society by uh sam francis this like you know no, racist. you did the the, the leviathan one not the managerial i'm sorry society. no you're right it's excuse me it's called um leviathan and its enemies that's drawing off of james burnham uh managerial society and this in the hands of the guy that we were reading, Sam Francis, it becomes a crypto, like racist right wing theory of class, which has this Faberian, like it does have this Faberian class sociology underneath it. Like, but but it, Burnham and Burnham is crypto too. I mean, the the managerial yeah. is like which managers are you going to side with? 
And because because the true ownership of capital isn't relevant anymore. In the early days, it's because capital ownership is diffuse. But when you talk about the current theories of it, as expressed in uh, and things like the bellows to bring it up again, um, they they it is literally just having a degree makes you a PMC because you're a knowledge worker. Knowledge workers are professionally managing society, and because. I guess all values fake or something. I don't know what they think is going on um, because they don't state it. They get to like metaphors from history about black smoke or what the fuck ever. Um, and, and they conflate domination, exploitation and oppression as if they're all the same thing. And all these credentialed people, which are, which, you know, is this, elite 40 percent also 40 percent is an elite no um elite 40 percent of the society um that that dominates of which so when i spell out what they're actually saying is what i'm trying to do they're conflating at least three different class theories they have a they they're basically saying that production doesn't matter but they won't actually admit that's what they're saying they'll also say that basically the petite bourgeois are the working class um are they strongly imply it so, um, because they still do physical labor, <laughs> which which kind of resonates with the American conception of of workers' identity, which is not anything like we would have wanted it to be. Yeah, uh, so it's says. the blue it's the blue collar cultural workers' identity versus the productive capacity workers' identity, and. The domination thing is why I keep on saying instead of going to this PMC bullshit, why don't you leave Eric Owen right? Because his his discussion of domination gets you out of these conflations immediately. Yeah, um, and part part of what those uh, professional managerial class PMC theorists are are getting towards is because Marxists that read you know Capital Volume Two and Three are like, whoa, production isn't the only thing in the economy, and because their notions of causality are very, I don't know, binary where like either something impacts something else or something doesn't impact something else. And, you know, there's no room for mutual interaction and causal asymmetry at the same time. Like, so once they realize that, you know, exchange and, you know, consumption and all these other economic processes have an impact on production, they lose the picture of production being the dominant force in society of sort of sub Marx as a supply side theorist, you right. know, like, well, it, I, I, my it, only, my only response to that as is that most of them actually don't read past capital volume one. And when things don't fit the capital volume one picture, they basically just kind of ad hoc invent shit. Sure. Um, but there, there are intelligent Marxists that read all three volumes of Capital, want to push back against the productive labor only, you know, volume one only version of Marxism. And because in my view, they have trouble thinking of interaction in terms where, you know, one factor is still causally has this great importance. It's the same, you know, discussion about the causal interaction between forces and relations of production or between base and superstructure where there is mutual interaction, but one of them is holding the card that can really change everything. I and that doesn't, so. make, that doesn't make the other, you know, interacting actor, uh, epi completely epiphenomenal or useless, but it's just, I don't know. A it's, lot of them are also like, highly either explicitly or implicitly highly nationalist and yep. basically take what happens outside of usually the the uk or america to be like uh, almost entirely disconnected and just not at all a part of the analysis it starts with methodological nationalism and goes into political nationalism almost yeah all the time. yeah correct yeah. Where's the surplus but, coming from to give us our, to allow our monopoly fucking rents to come from? It doesn't matter. Let's just look at the nation's <laughs> thing. I just, yeah, I, PMC, I wanna... PMC is communing with Cthulhu to channel, uh, channel surplus from the nether realm. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's I mean, part of their evil conspiracy. 
but the, here's here's what I think the PMC thesis like speaks to, and why everybody's quoting it, and why it seems real to people on a like commonsensical level. It is because opportunity capture, and particularly because of domination and opportunity capture, because the person that you hate in your job, and I've been saying this for years since I read this book, because it like clarified something for me. Because I also was like, I hate my boss. I don't actually hate the owner of my job. I really don't. Like, like, I don't deal with the person exploiting me. I deal with the person telling me what to do. And and the domination theory immediately as was, oh, the person exploiting me is why there's someone needs to dominate me in the first place. But the person who I'm going to experience. So this is why when people talk about lived experience or class, I, I bring up the, the Badurian versus the Marxist thing because I think they're both true. My experience of class is Baduian. My the objective explanation of why this exists is Marxist. So like my experience of someone of my boss telling me what to do is that my boss can suck a blanky blank and I hate them. Um, except when my boss is nice to me and then I love them, right? <laughs> and then but but the reason why that exists is actually the larger structure capital and you know what you know what but people have what blows people's mind in the implication of why they avoid some of what this says if you take this at its face value managers because of their continuing of the of the of the productive circuit are actually also being exploited unless they're paid in terms of capital gain so unless they're paid in terms of stock and and that blows people's fucking mind, and they can't accept it. But <laughs> well, they could be, they could be played, they could be paid in cash. They, they might necessarily be exploited. It's not like the, the form of your your pay doesn't well, no, uh, uh, exploitation. Well, and a lot of tech workers are. I mean, I have a lot of friends and paid in ownership. Like you got to remember that if you're paid in stocks, you're paid in ownership of the company. Oh, I know, but like you can be you like uh, you can be not exploited. Like a boss can pay you above. Above, like what the what what your value is, that can happen. It happens in IT. People are making bank in IT in some well, because I, IT is not IT doesn't actually function on the on the normal production value because it's no okay. correct 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 correct. But I, I mean, like in certain specialized things, you like in say for example, guys working on uh, oil rigs in the North Sea, they make bank. Guys working in in uh, in in mines sometimes they make bank. You know, like that, the, but the, they're still the, exploited. They're just exploited at a less efficient level. Not necessarily. Like the the, the business. Can you be think that the business is paying? The, the, the business can make such a, a monopoly. Like, say, for example, there's a spike in gold production in the price of gold. Like, you you can get paid above the cost of your. You know, you can get paid. They can make profit even though they don't exploit you. They can make profit on uh, on like a. No, it, it, I, I don't think I don't think it works that way. If that doesn't make sense for extractive resources, because the fact that they make a super shit ton and can compensate you a lot, but they'll never compensate you everything that you the, did. No, no, there's, no, no. There's, that's wrong. Like, because the price of a, a barrel of oil is not linked to the labor. The price of a barrel of oil is not linked to the labor needed to put into it. So you're at, you can't get the oil without the labor. <laughs> yes, but it's not linked to the, the labor. It's linked to a kind of a monopoly price that's attained in the market because it's a key commodity. Did like did you cannot explain? You're mixing the, the, theories of value, Tom. No, you <laughs> cannot explain. Well, you cannot explain the changes in the price of oil with respect to the amount of labor that goes into it. It's just but, not the case. And thus, there are certain commodities. You don't explain anyway, this is a technical you don't explain point. The, you the price in anything by the value of labor. That Dialectical. No, no, no. <laughs> but I'm actually like, this is basic fucking Marxist economics in the sense that like, if you think yes. you can predict price off of, off of L... Off of LTV, you're nuts. I know because you can't. <laughs> I know that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that there are there can be sectors where workers can basically get a wage that is not an exploited wage, and that firm that's operating in certain key sectors makes their profits not based on exploitation mainly, but on other factors like the like the, the extraction of monopoly rents. But, but, okay, if it's, if if we're dealing with monopoly rents, sure. The issue that we have with extractive commodities like gold and oil and those is that futures okay. fuck this up um, because they what don't. you're all yes they do because fu like they don't like they there's don't. not a monopoly price on oil like there isn't it's <laughs> a free market price have you heard of OPEC 
it's not the only provider of oil. Have you seen what happened to Venezuela? It's I know that, OPEC, but, but like, OPEC, oh, Venezuela, well, Venezuela is not in trouble because of its production of oil. It's in, yes, it is. It's in, it's in, it's in problems because of its sanction, the sanctions on its oil production. Let's get it that was, straight. Whatever, Tom, I, I think, you're actually I, just wrong. I think, so, I, think should, like, I think we should walk back to something a little more tractable because, <laughs> okay, there's an interesting pr uh, thing to be had here. Derek, I agree with you. Um, but like ultimately for management, right? Like it is re like there is the potential and I, I will say this. I don't think the potential is there. Tom, you know, you might disagree. That's okay. We'll talk about that another time. Um, but there is a potential for management to not be exploited based on rents or something. But for the most part, managers, like, unless you're the CEO, unless you're the top dog, like, Man, like managers are exploited, like, and they're dominating and they're not exploited at the same rate as the rest of the workers. And in fact, in a way, all the managers are doing is sort of like securing the value production of other workers. Like, so it's, you know, it's kind of a puzzle, but what this does is it dissolves with uh, dialectical acid, the, uh, Oh, oh, the, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. You see what I did there? Yeah. It, it dissolves the easy moral picture that the classical workers movement has, but also what this like, you know, reactionary PMC kind of thesis has. It dissolves both of the easy moralisms of, oh. of those things. Is right. Like and, a, and to, to, to Tom's, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, and, and to, to Tom's point a little bit, especially in regards to like IT workers, tech workers, that kind of thing. Uh, EO Wright does have this this passage here. It says, highly educated professionals in some categories of technical workers have sufficient control over knowledge, a critical resource in contemporary economies and skills that they can maintain considerable autonomy from domination within work and significantly reduce or potentially even neutralize the extent to which they are exploited. And I think that that is part of the reason why that, that uh, sort of lived experience of the working class uh, that Derek was talking about uh, can can feed into this kind of like PMC thesis feeling, having a truthiness to it. Yeah, although I, let's talk about the tech sector for a second um, because this is where like getting your Marxist economic categories are really important. And Tom was actually right on this. Tech Intellectual property isn't a commodity unless it's made so by the state, by artificial scarcity. And thus requires a strong state to make so by the state, by artificial scarcity. If if you remove IP from the tech sector, it's free to reproduce are fucking close to it. Yeah. So yeah. that's why I used oil. That's why I was using oil as an example, whereby well, oil, there, oil, is a, there is a product where the, but the product's price is way, way above its actual cost of production. Oh well, yeah, 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 but but it, but and that's why I mean you can get a next. You don't necessarily you can be a skilled Tom, worker you, in oil are, and not be exploited. I'm not sure that that's true, Tom. A, if you're making a profit, you are still being exploited. Even if like if those companies can make a profit, even if they can make a profit from monopoly rent, there is exploitation happening. Um, the the issue is you're trying to no. have your you're trying to you're trying to be a marginalist in one sector of the economy and a fucking labor theory value theory in another, and you can't. Well, yeah, oh, like... there's there's surplus flits between different places, and it's sucked from different places, and that can override the need to exploit in, but, in but, certain but, but, minor but, but, minor cases. But I do agree full heartedly with what Esri was saying with the next with the example of like you you're a manager in McDonald's, right? You're still being exploited. You know that's the key point. But also, like it leads to it leads to dumb shit, like people thinking they can have socialism based off one commodity even because it's a labor extractive commodity monopoly. And then when that fails, they blame sanctions because they're fucking morons. So like, like um, I, I'm, I'm really think you need to get your analysis straight, Tom. I think like, Derek, you're arguing over, we're arguing over something we're not even arguing over. Oh no, we're arguing over something that really matters. Uh, we should, we should square off about this in a, in a, in a dedicated ring. way in a at ring. some time. Yeah. In, in a 100,000 card American, Capital One reading series. Gun, so don't, don't challenge me to a ring. All right. <laughs> a, a, one, a 100, I like that, Tiberius, a 100,000 part Capital reading series. <laughs> that, that's probably right. Where we do all four volumes and the Grund Research. Oh, God. Can you imagine? 
Um, do, do we do, yeah. do we do Death of the Universe would occur both, before uh, that finished. Yeah. <laughs> do we do both yeah. versions of the economic manuscripts that they're based oh, off of, too? Fucking shoot me. <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you, the, the, the universe will be heat death. You know, all our books will be dissipated throughout the cosmos by the time we finish that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The difference between Marx and Marxist. Marx dies before he writes capital. <laughs> Marxists <laughs> die before they read capital. <laughs> That is 100% true. That is, that, that's going to be like, Kyle looked like he was floating for a kind of Joe Biden, uh, the Brumaire, 18 Brumaire of Joe Biden line with the Cthulhu, but I think, Ezri, you might have just got it. <laughs> I was just going to say this, this PMC thesis sounds like it gets into Pol Pot territory if you take it to its logical conclusion. Mm, you have smooth hands? Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. it, it kind of the PMC thesis stuff get it gets into a lot of territory. I think it's I I I think it's I think it's a way of explaining this that's inherently reactionary, and there's a reason why. Settle it, and Smash Brothers. Yeah, that's, that's not violent <laughs> enough. All right, <laughs> fine. Settle it in Mortal Kombat. Okay, that's fair. I can do that. Um, will we move on? Yes. Let's oh, yes. Okay. Let's go on. We're on to class as exploitation and domination. Okay. So uh, we're going to talk about why this is, it's more than just exclusion. So this is getting into the idea of, you know, co this continuous lived relation uh, of, you know, of exploitation versus just an exclusion from a particular role uh, or whatever, particular place. The clearances excluded uh, peasants from land then bringing those peasants back on the land as agricultural laborers, thus stealing the land and then exploiting and dominating the laborers. So there's like a kind of a, the initial sin here of like stealing the land and then this ongoing exploitation relation. Yeah. This is a stronger form of relational interdependency than simple exclusion. You know, because it, it lives forever. It's like, you know, if, if, you know, if my if, if, if my great grandfather got like his car stolen, it wouldn't affect me, you know, but if the land was gone and I had to work on the land, I'd be screwed, you know. Um, the ongoing relationship between the activities of the advantaged and disadvantaged persons, not just a relationship between their conditions. So that that's kind of, you know, bringing this temporal idea into the into the difference between like this idea of exclusion versus this ongoing work relationship. And finally, exploitation and domination are forms of structured inequality that require continual active cooperation between both the exploiters and the exploiters, the dominators and the dominated. And this is getting into what we've just been talking about, this relationship that's ongoing relation between the exploiter and the exploiter, the dominator and the dominator, having this kind of weird, which I cannot say, the D words now. I can say this like weird relational interchange. How about that? Yeah. Well, <laughs> what, what's uh, what's a uh, wolf's uh, what's wolf's code word for dialectical? Overdetermined over determination. It's oh. overdetermined relationship. That, that's that's that's, 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 that's Altusser. That's Altusser. And Wolf is trying to hide his Altusserianism. Also, like, yeah, it's not. I hate the way Altusser ruined the ter the term overdetermined because it's actually really useful and logical yeah. analysis yeah. but um anyway not to not to yell at tom more but um the i think i think actually tom you're actually this is interesting that you're on something here because domination is is actually even in marxism the beginning step so look if you like the clearances for excluded peasants from the land that's a domination move you can only do that by physical by 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 physical force, but what makes right. capitalism different from other attempts of doing like the reason why the English settler colonies did things differently than the Spanish settler colonies is the, the step of free labor turning into exploitation, even if it's based off of quote, primitive accumulation, unquote. And I use that quotations because I think if you actually read the German, I'm not actually disputing primitive accumulation, but if you actually read the German, it means something more like so-called primal accumulation, our yeah, original like accumulation, pr primary or er yeah. or some yeah yeah. So like, like it, so like yeah. yeah, it doesn't mean like 
primitive happens a long time ago and only happens to in this early stage of development, which is, I think, wrong. Like, it's Marx, a wrong way to understand this. Marx says Thomas Aquinas and original sin. Is that what we're saying? I kind actually on this kind of yeah the the, yeah. This is the original form of proprietarianism is I take this shit from you and I got guns what you gonna do about it like um, I, I actually like the the phrase primary accumulation uh, in that yeah it's better it's not doesn't have this dumb like kind of colonial tinge to it that when I read when we did in Kappa reading group with Precious and she winced every single time the word like primitive was used you know i think it's a a bad word we should kind of excoriate it out of max um it's not what the german means anyway so cancel the word <laughs> yes <laughs> political correctness yes uh this uh continuous relation of exploitation uh, this uh, continual act of cooperation between explorers and exploited dominators and dominated, I think is like something that really comes up in the simple reproduction section in chap in, in, in volume one. Uh, right. And this is like, I feel like this is a thing that so many people don't take away from reading capital like they still maintain this uh, very uh, distributionist understanding of uh, class struggle after reading it. Like they don't, it doesn't, it doesn't stick that like, yeah, this is in a very, like in a very real sense, an activity is something that is ongoing and it's relational. It's not just rich people are rich let's take their stuff problem solved, um, which is so many people's idea of class struggle and which is only uh, really meaningful within the context of uh, the first uh, theory of class that we've discussed. Yeah, maybe um, because... the second, actually. But... Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess it depends on like how enduring the forms of capture are, because like there are definitely cases where the the form of capture is is uh, enduring past any kind of uh, seizure of property, right? Yeah. To to me, this is what why why mere distributionary stuff is always uh, a non-starter because. I redistribute if I redistribute things within the same current system without changing the way we actually produce them. What have I done? I've changed. I've changed the people most likely to become the next dominant ruling class, and that's it. It's right. the uh, it's the it's the Sumerian kings uh, canceling the debt every fifty years. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. It, 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 like it, like actually, it saves capital from certain crises that it would develop otherwise, and or even proto capital in the case of the Sumerian king. But like it, it doesn't change much. So this is this is one of these things where I think um, where like I'm not totally hostile to MMT more. Uh, yep, yeah, yeah. I know why well, uh, uh, Jar has made the point on primitive accumulation. Also, this is why why Mar Marx actually uses the German phrase for so-called directly in front of it when he mentions it. Um. So. Uh. I How will about, also say, jar not come on here. Sorry. Yeah. Go for it. That's, that's a very good point. Um, I will also say that the, the distributionist form of uh, class struggle that you're talking about there, Derek, uh, it's, it, you know, just to put this completely in the cultural gutter, this, it just reminds me of Thanos in Avengers Endgame. It's like, I'm going to kill half the people. Overpopulation solved forever. My job here is done. <laughs> like having no systems understanding at all. Oh, just, yeah. just fucking. Oh yeah, there we go. Done it. Solved the problem. But yeah, it's like uh, it's like Thanos for debt. That's what a, ju a jubilee is like. Yeah. Speaking of Thomas Aquinas and, and Catholics, the, uh, the you know that the Christian brothers, the founder of the Christian brothers, are trying to make him a, a, a pope. Uh, they're trying to make him a saint. I think they made him a saint uh, under the old dude Ratzinger or whatever. Uh, he just basically went out and fucking made everybody a goddamn saint. Uh, but he, you know they have to have a certain number of uh, they have to have a certain number of 
of miracles before you can be made a saint under the Catholic Church. So basically what they do is they just start making up these miracles. And I think the Christian Brotherhood, you know, what they one of the miracles, I think you need three to be a saint, you need two to be canonized. There's all this like kind of stuff. But one of them was that he did the the, the miracle of bilocation that like somebody saw him in Wexford town and really somebody else saw him in like New Ross at the same time. <laughs> they just, oh man, fucking hilarious Catholics, man. You gotta love them. Are we good here? Let's move it on. They also uh, find his dog. Go on. Sorry. sorry. I, I just, there's a couple of comments in the chat. They're wondering what the original German was for uh, primitive. It was Ersprunglich, I guess, or, which means original initial. Anyway. Okay, yeah, although to be fair, finally, like yeah. Jar is right that the the word that Smith uses is accumulation, which is why Marx uses so called so -call. literally so called primitive accumulation in the word. And I've had people yell at me, like like post colonial post Marxists yell at me about this for a long time, like the judgment in primitive. And I'm like, that's not. It's like one. I don't even think that's what Emmett Smith is talking about. But two, that's definitely not what Marx is talking about. Like, well. Anytime we say the word primitive accumulation, we should go primitive accumulation. Yeah. That'll yeah. get the yeah. that'll get it across. Okay. Yeah. So look at this. We've got ourselves a table. It's been too long in our reading groups that we don't have enough tables in them. This is something that I've been working hard on. So, Goddamn math nerds. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so he basically breaks down these three different ones. And so it's the approach. Uh, the economic conditions and the economic uh, activities and shows how some of them are non-relational, relational and mixes of the two. So with the kind of stratification way of looking at class, he says here that in the economic conditions is not even relational. They don't talk about the economic relations and in the economic activities, they, so they, they say they don't even talk about it's relational, uh, it, about it being not relation about it being relational. So then we got our our Weberian or our opportunity hoard, opportunity hoarding, and it basically talks about the relations of the economic conditions, but it doesn't talk about the ongoing temporal exploitation domination in the system. And finally, we got Marxus, who is relational in both ways. Who would have guessed it? A kind of, you know, a dialectical one would be relational in all areas. Does that mean I have to move on? Yep, no. time to move on. No more, no further discussion no. allowed. No. <laughs> you know what? You know what's funny about this though is like this whole system is a, trying to get out of being dialectical. Like, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Like it, it, it's it's really funny because it's just like, well, if you actually accepted that, I don't know that there was some truth to dialectical oppositional dynamics, and not, and it wasn't all just Hegelian theology. Then maybe you wouldn't need so many fucking tables. So I don't know about that because we just spent a long time talking about how people have conflated all of these different things. And like there's just certain modes of reasoning that don't do a good job of specifying what they're talking about. If you allow definitions to emerge from a conversation, and then turns out the conversation just has people talking past each other, it's fine to do this. It's not no, to get away so. from the it's not to get away from the relational qualities of the theory. That's the you know the one little like piddling ounce of respect I have for Althusser is that he was like, well, how this is some bong rip theology. How are we going to make this really scientific? Oh, I know. I'll just do a bunch of other bong rip like theology based on like a different. Like, I was going to uh, say like do worse bong rip theologies well, that have no structural cohesion to them. Well, that's. That's the thing about Althusser is that he starts from this sort of reasonable place and just gets worse and worse. Whereas like the analytics kind of are trying to do, especially the ones that are coming out of Althusserian tradition, excuse me, Althusserian tradition like Cohen and Wright, you know, that's, that's their kind of common heritage, um, is, you know, like actually spelling out what the terms of, of these theories are. Um, I think, I don't know. I, I think in a way the dialectics they're trying to destroy ultimately is the like the state ideology aspect of this. Like there are there are kind of analytical Marxists that want to destroy um, you know, like emergent properties or whatever, but they lose. They lose the methodological debate like 
in the broad in the long run, even if they you know convince some of the smarter analytical Marxists. In the 80s. Well, I was about to, I was about to say, um, unfortunately, Esri, there are no analytical Marxists left. So, so should there, I start a blog called "The Last Analytical Marxist"? <laughs> yes, maybe because. <laughs> yeah. uh, because yeah. I mean, in, in some sense, like even E.O. Wright, once we get to the end of this book, we're going to have to deal with the fact that like the opposition to analytics means he basically doesn't have a value theory. And this is why I was yelling at Tom earlier, because he, he floats through different ones and they don't work together. Um, and you like it's you basically have to start like, well, in this part of the economy, we operate under this value system. And in this part of the comp comp oh, economy, we operate under this. Don't even start I, it. Don't even start. <laughs> Let me start I'm misrepresenting me. This is not on you. This is what I this I actually think like this book, once we get to later chapters, leads itself to that kind of thinking because like like he can't defend labor theory of value without dialectics. You know, it like when you when you look at these tables of relation and non-relational and you try and shoehorn this massively like relational system with feedback loops all over the place. It's kind of like, it reminds me of, you know, like Conway's game of life where you have these yes. extraordinarily simple rules and you put them in and these massively complex behaviors that are essentially a totally unpredictable, like, but you can see them at other higher layers of interaction, having their own logics or, and reflexing back to, on themselves that are completely non-obvious. And I think that yes. basic insight is the problem with trying to shoehorn everything into this analytical framework that there will be emergent stuff. And, you know, our, you know, but that does not mean, I agree with Lexi that, Esri, that we can't uh, use the analytical toolbox where it is useful because we can certainly see that we've, we've used it so far in this to look at the deep core problems with some of these analysis people are making. So basically, we have a meta dialectical problem where we need to put dialectics against analytics and a dialectical methodology, which makes us go oh, through oh, the analytic oh, ablation to, oh, to, 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 to do, would, do a bunch of charts. Oh, I would agree with most oh, of we're that. We're on the next slide. We're on the next slide. Oh, yeah, baby. Yes, baby. We're on the next slide. Except for the word methodology, I would agree with that. <laughs> Oh, that was excellent. We're, wow. we're in the greater logic now, folks. I, I, honestly, I'm spent. I don't know if I'm going to be able for a second slide. <laughs> we're almost done with this little bit of the section. We're okay, so I'm joking. We're Let, so let's close. go. So we have a, we have on this slide a. I will have to inter, interclude all the the links to these slides as well on the on the show notes so people can follow along they're yeah. listening in six months when we finally finish editing the goddamn fucking premiere do you know what i did today i did <laughs> the premiere. Oh, i did i, I edited premiere but i also did visuals for premiere episodes up to the 32nd episode I, how I, many episodes did we got did we do we have currently we've released 22 and i reckon there might be up to 10 new ones to come and i did you know what i did on top of this i did images for 32 parts for understanding class. That's wow. what it's going to, that's my estimate for what's going to, that's what it's going to do. Okay, sorry. So moving on here. So patreon.com slash from alpha to omega. Seriously? <laughs> oh my. <laughs> now, uh, this uh, class is exploitation and domination. So do we have our, our graph, our, our lovely little uh, diagram here that uh, we have to try and talk about some of the exploitation and domination kind of process through time, I think. We have our power relations and legal rules that give people effective control over economic resources. So that's kind of like our, our superstructure, but also kind of like the initial, it looks like kind of like the initial Weberian, we've got the enclosure here. Then we have, I don't know, power relations. No, that's the power relations. Then we have social closure and opportunity hoarding among social positions. And then we have locations within the relations of domination and exploitation and production. And then finally, we have conflict over production. Whew. I So let's break this down. The first one he's saying here is, is if this is a set, is this like our initial is is this talking about our, our our initial original sin and our superstructure that which essentially enforces this original sin i, I, I wanted 
Yeah. It's the base and the superstructure. It's power relations and legal rules. Power relations themselves are the structuring things that are like underneath the legal rule. Okay, yeah, like, that's, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I would actually, I would say that power relations emerges from, from before law. I also say this is why the base superstructure metaphor doesn't, I think it's actually correct, but me, people ignore the Marx talks about it as a feedback loop, like explicitly that it's that one is informing the other, morphing into the other, informing the other until in the final instance the base dominates, whatever the hell that means. Um, instead of like everything is emergent from the base and everything that's superstructural is unimportant because. Legal rules really matter for class. They absolutely do. They matter for ownership. They matter for when the state can shoot you about taking property and when it yeah. can't. And like it, 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 you know, it's kind of a big deal. Okay. So the, so the next one here is social closure and opportunity hoarding among social positions. Now, what is he getting at here, Esri? Well, what he's getting at is that this is the special case of the general Weberian case. It's specifically social closure over social positions based on power relations and legal property law. So like... Getting your degree, getting your whatever, well, accreditation. At, at, at this point, I think he's actually talking about the ability to own property specifically. Yes. Like the, it's, the it's, social closure stuff. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, it's literally just like who has ownership rights, and then what? Yes. What do those ownership rights afford? Right. So, like the other kinds of opportunity hoarding would be covered in the Weberian class of opportunity hoarding model, whereas this is more specifically like this is all the setup for capitalism. I, it it always kind of blew my mind that there was the whole like John Romer side of analytical Marxism that was all about distribution in this really like mathematically kind of like worked out way, because for me, the big revelation for Marxist economics was that like all of that distribution shit and, you know, thinking about distributional justice and all, and all this stuff didn't really consider, you know, the initial setting of the game, the initial setting of the table in, you know, primary accumulation. And there's a uh, there's a whole debate in analytical philosophy going back and forth between John Rawls and Robert Nozick about whether you know capitalism is just. And then eventually, the libertarian uh, capitalist John uh, um, Robert Nozick gets put on the fence and says, "Well, you know, it's it would all be just if the initial setup for capitalism was just," which. <laughs> if I know anything about the initial setup for capitalism, <laughs> yeah. um, it has to be bracketed out in order to make capitalism have its own standards of justice that don't violate the society, um, that don't destroy the society by trying to consider them. Like there's the, you know, the whole Marxist notion of capital exploiting justly and justice being a, a term that is totally relative the, it all dwells in the process in the first two bits of this graph. And then when you're looking at the locations within domination, exploitation and conflict over production, you know, most people locked into capitalism. Um, I, I mean, maybe this is a little different today, but I think in general, this is true. Um, most people just don't have the first two in their purview. That, like that's like the first two things here, the power relations and legal rules, and then the social closure and opportunity hoarding among social positions with those property rules. Like what's being talked about here is the opportunity to employ people because you own, you own stuff. Like that's the, that's the social closure and opportunity hoarding among social positions is if you don't, you know, own a big swath of land, you know, you can't hire people to work on your land. <laughs> you can't have that role. I mean, it sounds even kind of silly to talk about it in terms of social closure because the, you just don't have the thing to employ people with, but it is. Well, it, it yeah, counts. exactly. It's like people don't even, it, like the, 
capitalist ideology is so entrenched that it seems weird to even talk about uh, ownership as social closure when it's like actually if you step back and think for a second, it's kind of like, oh, no, obviously that is that's what it is. <laughs> well, and that's also why capitalists do this thing where they redefine what capital is and what, you know. I was reading Mandel's, uh, Ernest Mandel's um, short introduction to Marxism and Marxist economics. It was like 100 pages. I, it's super orthodox in ways that aren't totally defensible, but I think I think people should read it to like get what like what Marxists used to think. Um, and, uh, he's also, uh, Mandel's also very good on like understanding the Aristotelian and Hegelian stuff and Marx and that's all over the place. Um, but the, <laughs> um, the power relations, he, he makes this sly observation that capitalists keep on redefining capital from what they meant about it, um, classically. So that like the first, the way they define on capital is the first monkey who grabbed a banana is actually the first capitalist. And um, the reason why they do that is because it naturalizes away step one and two, um, yeah. which is which is uh, Mandel's point with that. Yeah, absolutely. It's the it's the Robinson Crusoe critique in, in volume one. Um, what, what, what I really like about this graph is how it ends up with the final one is conflict over production. And I think that is the logic of capital. That's where you're going to get you're, it's it's weird. Like when we we see today, all the the left stuff is about distribution, you know. But if we look at where does the conflict in the system naturally occur, it really occurs in production. It doesn't so much occur in distribution. Yeah, I I don't know what people think about that. What? No, there's they're both true. Yeah, there's a sort of language game that comes up here in that distribution never talks about the distribution of the means of production. It only talks about distribution of the fruits of Correct. the means of production. And like, if it's this very ideological notion of distribution, because yeah, if you talked about distribution of you know, means of production, then, you know, problem solved. But that's not what Marx is talking about when he's talking about, you know, uh, the utopia of exchange and Bentham and whatever and, and capital, you know, after, after getting through all this horrific, all this horrific stuff about production. And then, yeah, let's talk about exchange, you know, exchange. It's fair. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you... uh, well, Go ahead. I, I, was, I was just going to say like, you're right, Tom, where like the production uh, conflict over production is the logical point of origination. Uh, but uh, of course, distributionary conflicts, you know, like, oh, let's just say something like, uh, IP law causing millions upon millions of people to go without access to vaccination uh, is is uh, is also relevant yep. to 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 lived conflict. Never, never uh, going to happen. Never going to happen. Never going to happen. <laughs> yeah, uh, but uh, you know, um, I believe there is a passage where Marx talks about this, and he talks about. Um, production predominating over itself in the antithetical definition of production, uh, which is just that you have production in like that kind of very basic sense, but then you also have production in this way that we're talking about here as like the logical origination point of conflict uh, that is like more than just simply uh, making stuff. It's like what the relations involved in that engender in the whole capitalist system. Okay, are we good to hit the dialectic buzzword? Anybody want to get in on this? Uh, yeah, sorry, I just said a dialectical thing. Sorry. Yeah, Don't. let's go. Let's go. <laughs> let's keep okay. going. Yeah. Okay, so now more on class and exploitation of domination. Okay. He says here that the central division in a capitalist society is between those who own and control the means of production in the economy and those who are hired to use the means of production. So the capitalists and the workers. Uh, other positions within the class structure get their specific character from their relationship to this basic structure. You know, so like 
your role as a manager or PMC, whatever the hell, God damn it, you know, or a lawyer or whatever it is, it's based within that general like core relation between the owners and the non-own workers. Managers exercise many of the powers of domination, but are also subordinate to capitalists. Uh, yeah, nothing to say about that. Uh, nothing to say? No. Well, let's just move on. Uh, we said CEO, before. Yeah. CEOs and top managers often develop significant ownership stakes. This is going to Derek's point, and therefore become like capitalists. Yep. But they even do this. Stock. Yeah, but they even do this. Like when I worked in uh, the bank and I worked in um ericsson you know doing it jobs you would get actually shares every year it was this oh, idea yeah. you know like kind of a neoliberal idea of giving people small amounts of shares to give them like you know feel like they're a part of the firm and so they'll the feel... ownership society exactly yeah well, when you know, i worked so... for lowe's they gave me sh i mean even as a lowly stock worker they actually gave me like one one hundredth of a share for like working there and it actually that's why i was so critical of co-ops as the answer to capitalism because i'm like i know a lot of corporations that let that let you know uh all employees technically own a share so that will so that we will export ourselves more um to increase our stock value <laughs> i like back in like 2000 i was working in ericsson and before the bubble burst like the shares i i, I you could you could double up the amount of shares you get from your wages. You could take your Christmas bonus as shares. So I did, and like then in two thousand and one, the shares dropped from I think it was two hundred and thirty SEK. So it was like twenty three pounds or like thirty dollars a share to like thirty cents a share. It dropped by ninety nine percent. So all my like my Christmas bonus for a few years, it just got like I mean I still have the shares. Oh. They're they're floating around somewhere. I haven't looked at them in twenty years. <laughs> Uh, but I had never gone near them. But I literally had like a few thousand dollars worth of shares that lost ninety nine, literally ninety nine percent of their value. Um, okay. Right. Um, highly educated professionals and some technical workers have uh, what is that? Sufficient? That's some bad spelling. Have have sufficient control over knowledge and skills that they can maintain considerable autonomy from domination and even exploitation. This is going to your point earlier, Kyle. And this is something. I personally experienced working in, say, uh, when I worked for Ericsson and the bank, like when you work with these, like as a kind of a, a skilled worker in these businesses where they are essentially like massive monopolies, like in, say, European telecoms, there was like, there was essentially two or three suppliers and they just got, they didn't have much competition between each other. They had they could massive amount of these huge contracts. There was a little competition. It was like cartel. And, you know, we used to do nearly no work, nearly no work. Like you, people used to go in, take a sick day every week. No one would say anything because they had they would they literally would sit there in Ireland, Ericsson, and suck on the teeth of like the state telephone company and just uh, sell them hundreds of millions. They were so inefficient. More and more, the more you talk. I'm just like, why? Why aren't you exploited appropriately? No, Seriously, um. <laughs> I used, we, we used to get listen to this. We used to get like a half day every Friday. Right. And most of the time it was in the dot com boom when on a Thursday evening, our boss would have a uh, had have a credit card and he put it behind the bar and we'd all get so smashed that we wouldn't be able to make it into work until maybe half 11 on a Friday. And then we'd leave at one o'clock like that was the regime. See, and in you're the describing socialism for me, this is what I think socialism is. We all get to work for three hours and get smashed at one o'clock on a Friday. No, um. <laughs> That's literally so. Like my father was always asking me, "And do you not have to clock in?" I was like, "No, man, <laughs> you're you're joking." Like but you, you know, know so you know what's interesting about that? There was a teacher. I don't have to clock in either, but because if we actually clocked in all the work I did, they'd have to pay me for it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, that's that's a big part of being a teacher. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I, I figured out. I there are some weeks I work up to sixty hours. I mean, so like, it's and that's before I do this shit with you guys. Um, my 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 last teaching job is working ninety hours a week. Jesus. So I mean. One thing I'm interested in this, because I, I buy, Tom, particularly when monopoly capital sectors, and I think monopoly capital monopoly capital 
has like a bunch of different meanings, even in Marxism, but specifically in areas where the state grants a monopoly licensure, you're completely right. There's also these weird quasi areas where there's where where there's legal protections that create. I mean, tenured professorates is one of those where it's like, I like, I, you know, I have a hard time crying over the the struggles of a tenured professor ever. Because I know, like, even the works that's published under their name, half of it's done by grad by graduate right. student indentured servitude, and like the entire thing. Like, and you know, I used to teach an eight eight load, and listening to them complain about a three two load for those you know, like three classes in a in a semester and two classes the next because they have to do like one research paper a year. It just makes me, you know, like like I get why working class people hate them. Like, like I I do actually. Um, and their relationship to even what class structure they're in is weird. Like, like it, it is quite strange. Um, but I would not say they completely get out of exploitation. I would say they get, like, they're minimally exploited. But they're, if they weren't exploited some, that was my point even about the oil workers, there would be no, there would be no profitability in it. Um, because they could just do it themselves. Um, so... I, I do find that interesting, and I find I also find the fact that we're in an age where um, a lot of these, like one of the attractions of the PMC thesis that is perverse to me, is one of the things that people are are angry about is the overproduction of elites, right? But they're also they're also angry about the fact that all these people are being forced into more and more spheres of life. So you have all these educated people. And so they're mad that these people want what exactly? Because they're, they're being mad told. that people are, are being educated. Yeah, they're mad that people are being educated and that they're pro Seriously. like how, how dare you how dare you bring intelligence to our proletarianized fields and want us to like not just be groveling, you know. Um and and it's funny because it's it's funny because they're literally complaining about something all the working class families I know really fought for. Like if you were a working class family with sense, you fought to have your kids educated. And the last generation was the yeah. first I mean, was the first generation where a lot of us were. Because it was like what my my dad used to tell me, like, you know, you know, he was a my stepdad was a mechanic, and he'd be like, There's not gonna be enough jobs for you if you stay and you like try to do shit work with your hands. Um, you have to go get educated, even if you want to do this. Like, and he was right. Like, like, and now those jobs are disappearing yeah. too, because you know. Um, it, it reminds me of of when I like when I went to college in in Trinity in Dublin, because Trinity what well, used to be like you used to get excommunicated up into the seventies in Ireland. You'd be excommunicated from the Catholic Church if you went to Trinity because it was like a Protestant yeah. college. So it was only like in the mid seventies, but like the, most of the so it was in the nineties, like all of the all all of the uh, professors that the ones that were Irish, nearly all of them were essentially had English accents because they were all like landed Protestant gentry, and I always got the feeling all, of them that they were like, you know, these are the unwashed coming in here <laughs> with their actual <laughs> Irish accents. Seriously, swear to God, yeah, I felt, and I feel yeah. like. There's a similar dynamic with this idea of like, you know, we cannot have baristas understanding, you know, Deleuze, you know, this is not right, <laughs> you know, and I think that's a lot of it. People actually just want to be an elite. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the thing that we didn't mention about the PMC stuff is that a lot of the people who articulate this are from the background they're complaining about. All of them. Every. Yeah, I haven't found I, one who wasn't. <laughs> I've met one on the internet and they made a big deal about it and they didn't seem to the mind. The rarest Pokemon. I know I found, I found, I found him, you know, he, he didn't seem to mind that everyone else that he's boosting is from that. And then he also didn't seem to mind that uh, Turchin, a uh, Peter Turchin, where a lot of the PMC elite, you know, the PMC uh, politico, like anti politico, whatever is get their quote class theory from, believes that you need a, basically a middle strata to con make any political like any like p political counter movement you need counter elites to capture that momentum and and create a 
socially stratified society. That, that you should treat the working class like you treat a natural resource, that it doesn't act on its own accord ever. Like, right, or, like, or it does It does act on its own accord, but it doesn't matter unless counter-elites get involved. Right. Like, it, yeah. it doesn't, ha you can't, like, cohere into a new society. And that was That's also, the like, Burnham's thing about the managerial elites is that you had to just pick which form of management you were going to accept. Right. We should we should say James Burnham, not, you know, anti managerial, just thought mm -hmm. that this was a new fact of life and you had to pick one. OK, I was Sorry. just going to say, I think I think that a big part of that, that like the reason why the PMC thesis has uh, purchased and especially among the PMC themselves uh, is the explosion of like the bureaucratic managerial nature of society under the neoliberal era, where where basically like uh, over educated bureaucrats are being brought in above the the heads of the people who are actually doing the work and um, basically making everybody's lives a living hell through like the the over capture of information and like the expansion of the amount of work that you have to do to like satisfy these uh these quantitative uh uh targets uh i think i think that plays a huge part in like why uh why that that feel that kind of like i said before that has that kind of crunchy truthiness to it because like a lot of for for a lot of people like dealing with an educated person means dealing with a bureaucrat who's going to make you do garbage work for no reason. Well, yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's what, well, you know, what's interesting about that happening under neoliberalism though, because a lot of people think neoliberalism is really ordo liberalism. And it's just like, like, it just means that we have a laissez faire free market and historical entrepreneurs and, 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 and like the, the one th and he's not a Marxist, but the one theorist I think really understands this um, he wrote uh, Crisis is a Terrible Thing, The Race. Uh, what's his name? I interviewed him. Um, Murkowski? Yeah, Murkowski. That, that neoliberalism actually really depends on the state to construct more and more micro, um, basically ca captured markets that have privileged access um, to to create the appearance of profitability. Now he doesn't think profitability is a problem the same way Marxists do, but like I think that's exactly what's going on, and and that's why there's this bureaucratic explosion because these micro these micro these hyper managed really access limited um, uh, markets are also pretty strictly regulated in regimes of law, and this is also one of the reasons why I think we have to stand against. Um, a lot of like our liberal allegiances who thinks that we can fix all this through regulation because that's actually what's driving a lot of this cost disease and resentment. Um, yeah, right. it's it's getting it's getting uh, you're getting people within the state to uh, get yourself legal rights towards the ability to get yourself a higher surplus rate of return. You know, there's loads of mechanisms I think going on like that. When the profitability in the in the general economy is not good. You're going to get people battling over the right to get get that little super profit. Um, there's one last one in this that didn't fit on that last slide. I don't know if we've kind of done it already, but it's just saying that in both hoarding and exploitation, in both hoarding and the exploitation domination approaches, inequalities in income are sustained by the exercise of power, not simply by the act actions of individuals. So that's just uh, Weber and Marx kicking these stratification dudes in the face. That's essentially what we're saying here. <laughs> yes. Now. Yeah, ha, ha. This is where we start getting into the weird, oh, the weird increasingly yeah. complex. <laughs> I don't know. I do not know how, how this is going to work on a podcast. <laughs> Let's get this straight. Oh, so what we're looking at uh, here is a bunch of bubbles we, with we... arrows. Dragons. Excuse me. Can we, can we make this into a choose your own adventure? Yeah, <laughs> this is yeah. Busy. dragons be here. Okay, now. Well, and one. also this is a little simplified because you're also missing yes. the the causal effects versus the flow of people. Yeah. 
say that explain what you mean here tiberius so so in in the uh that that center column of uh three locations within relations market relations class relevant attributes like those those up arrows there are actually flows of people and the rest of the arrows are uh causal uh relationships that's yes. true yeah yeah very good okay then let's just <sighs> I think the only way we can deal with discussing this so that it would be intelligible to anybody who's going to listen to it is to kind of talk about maybe the last kind of box in in in, in more in more depth. I don't I don't know what people think because um, we've talked about a lot of these actual processes before. We've talked you know you. through them. Yeah. So like the That's general fun. gist is if we look if we line up all these models kind of alongside each other, we see that the stratification ends up with uh, the individual economic well-being um things being cited on the individual for the viberian we have conflicts over distribution and in marxian we've got the conflicts over production the only thing As, i'd say is in the viberian conflicts over distribution also also include conflicts over the distribution of the ability to produce like that's so mm -hmm. That's our so that's our that's our yeah okay that's our holding that, yeah that's our that's, that's where the topology of this thing gets really strange uh -huh. <laughs> yeah yeah like you know if we were to draw this diagram here like for people who are listening and who you know don't aren't looking at the slides we we have and talk to future listeners as well not just in the live stream but we have like nine box and a load of arrows. <laughs> Right, but really, most uh, most boxes have like maybe one arrow coming in and one or two maybe going out. But in reality, what we should have here is these nine boxes and each one with an arrow to each other one. So you, we should probably have like you know what would that be n, n, n factorial or something. Well, well, you know what I was. You know, I mean, I we're missing say. like three or four dimensions of this analysis here, so. Well, we're, yeah. we're missing... We need to be getting into hyperspace in order to properly like visualize this. Hyperspace. We're missing the arrows that go from conflict over production to conflict over distribution that feed back onto power relations and legal roles that come in on uh, 1.5, which is really funny because when I was looking at this, I'm like, damn, this is a complex diagram. Then you turn the page and there's an additional level of feedback complexity. But yeah. I, think, I think we could do this on a podcast by starting with the right box and then and then going all right let me so try let me I try with marxian have we not already, have we not already done it as in like yeah, kinda, the last two we hours have. i don't think, well, we I think kind this is just of like have but that but okay for instance marxian conflict over production is caused by locations within the relations of domination and exploitation in production which has flows of people from locations within market relations, jobs, occupations. Um, but, but the domination exploitation, uh, the domination exploitation relations in production and those and locations are caused by social enclosure, opportunity hoarding, opportunity hoarding caused by legal relations, uh, legal rules, power relations that give people effective control. We could, we could feed back like that. We Except could feed back like do, that. the stratification one, which like, feeds back in every direction. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what yeah. I said. Yeah. I don't think it's going to be particularly... What we should do is basically, I think, say to people to look at this goddamn slide after listening to... Yeah. Or make it the cover art. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Nobody uh, looks at the goddamn cover art. That's what I would say. Yeah. yeah, and and depending uh, on like what app you're using, you don't see the cover art. Yes, anyway. that's right. I don't see that's the cover right. art on Podkicker. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I would say uh, two cybernetic points here, if I may. The first you, one, you may, you may uh, not, is that uh, this medium that we are using uh, to convey the information does not have sufficient variety. <laughs> to convey the text which is within each of these as well as their relations to one another. The second one is um, I was I was uh, actually listening to an interview with uh, Nora Bateson and she was talking about um, 
she was talking about cybernetics and where she thought that like systems theory and cybernetics had kind of gone wrong. And one thing that she said is that like, Nowhere in life are you going to find boxes with arrows that connect them uh, in the real world. And we need to be focused more on the relations between things and less these like simplified arrow uh, and box systems, which are like the fetish of all systems uh, practitioners. So just a cautionary thing to recognize the limitations of this uh, form of graphical representation. And this is actually a thing that um, that Stafford Beer always would mention is that like he was never satisfied with the viable system model because it never had enough representational power to convey the systems in which it was trying to be applied. So it's, it's just, I don't know. There's like, there's all these kinds of like representational problems that we're going to run into with this. But all that being said, I do think the next chart is like pretty clear at making its point, even if this one isn't. Yeah, let let maybe let's head on to that. I I fully concur with your with all of those points. I think it's absolutely right. And but part of me is saying, but like, but Kyle, they would have never designed NetHack if you had that logic. <laughs> you know, so so screw you, Net Kyle. Screw cybernetics. I want my NetHack. NetHack is a beautiful thing. Uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna attack NetHack. <laughs> Okay, um, are we good to go on to the next bit? Do people or do people want to yeah, talk about this? Let's, let's do. Let's no, go it's on. Fine. Okay, so here's him saying what the problems with this model is. So kind of getting towards what we have been here saying a little bit. This treats power relations and legal rules as exogenous structures given given to us from the alien overlords, no doubt. These basic power relations are themselves shaped by class processes. So this is this idea of feedback. Um, structures of inequality are dynamic systems. You know, again, I think uh, similar feedback point. And the fate of individuals depend not just on micro level processes they encounter in their lives or on the social structures within which those take place, but on the trajectory of the system as a whole within which these micro processes occur. Like, Where you were born in a business cycle really matters. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The falling rate of yeah. profit is going to bite your ass. Well, you we know? just we just had this discussion in uh, the GIU uh, uh, Stafford Beer Reading Group uh, yesterday, where people were where we were talking about like intergenerational struggle, and I was like, well, like just basically making this point, like where you're born in a business cycle or where you're born on the trajectory of the brain of profit has a really big effect on how your generation, quote unquote experiences the world and right. it's just like that's just if you try to bracket that out and say like no 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 for the purposes of solidarity let's ignore all that you're just being no. an idealist like i was actually thinking about this in terms of america why why class politics in america seems so dominant is like think about what happened after world war ii i keep on bringing this mm -hmm. point up like we had 48% of the world's wealth and 5% of the hands of the planet. And they were able to spread it around during one generation that lasted, that really only lasted from 1945 to 1962. And like those people are the fucking baby boomers. Like yep. that's who they are. And like, this is what made the PMC thing so funny to me, actually, the, the bring it back to this and the, how this applies. And the PMC just is irrational on its face, but like, like, um, when they were talking about like, well, if you were to get college student debt relief, which I admit there are problems with it. We could go into that on another day, but you're, you're really having 6% of the population pay for 40% of the world's debt. But then I was like, yeah, but boomers disproportionately are the 6% that aren't educated because once you, the, the younger you get, the more likely you are to have a college degree. By the time you hit 35, it's like 6% of the, population or more has had access to college and gone to college to some to some level um 
And that means that the boomers who don't have college educations are disproportionately better off even even then their projected future status is for some of the people that they're talking about with these degrees who are parts of the quote elite unquote because of their right. relationship in the long cycle of capital like where you are in a quandre cycle not even a short business cycle so like it's an idiotic argument to not take the broad spectrum of the last hundred years into account and in america that's the most extreme because we had the most accumulation at one time right you know it's it's like when you're you're in a plane you're flying over like Western Europe. You're going to do the dropping the parachutes in behind enemy lines. And, you, you know, your life expectancy is determined, you know, is, is linked to are you the first or the last to jump out of that goddamn plane? You know, <laughs> Are you going to be the first target or the last target? You know, where are you going to drop? Yeah, like, let, let's look at this dynamic micro. Unless somebody wants to get in on that, because I think we'll, we can talk over this. We talk about it over this lovely a dynamic micro macro model where he tries to put the idea of these power um, these conf these feedback loops into the previous model we've had but i i kind of expect that uh, so basically he's showing how conflict of production has a narrow feeding back into the initial power relations and legal rules uh, that give people objective control over the economic resources and yeah. conflicts of distribution having that feedback. But in reality, I think there's feedbacks at all levels to all things. Yeah, I was like, it really should be that you overlap those two. Th that split is actually just overlapping. They're not separate. Like conflict over production, conflict over distribution. Like just one's more primary than the other. And I don't know. It Again, I'm going to a second, Kyle, that like this is better. But it's like actually more vague than even the base superstructure model because of what it separates out where and how artificial that separation is. I mean, I, I think I think as you, we go further in the book, it'll demonstrate an awareness that this is an in reality an artificial separation. But in the theories, this is what theorists focus on, essentially. Like you don't get. Like, I don't know, in the Va in the Weberian literature, it's like less, obs I mean, Weber was interested in conflicts over production because he was in the SP day. But like, as it turns out, Weberian sociology has only a sort of tenuous relationship with Max Weber, the person. Isn't that true with yeah. most of these things? <laughs> like you've including it up to Marx. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, Marx. He's so unlike your Marxist. Um, Marx, I famously will... not a Marxist. Right. right. I, Keynes, I... Keynes, famously not a Keynesian. Yeah, <laughs> Keynesianism is like Hicks, right? Like it's not even Keynes. Well, uh, there's the there's the Cambridge School and then the American uh, yes. School, and yeah, no, no, it's that's a whole, fair. It's a whole thing. Um, uh, anyway. Um, I will say like this, this chart can be illuminating in some things. So for example, uh, one uh, tendency that happened over the 20th century was for capitalists to do salaried work. Um, not in the sense that they became workers, but just in the sense that like, or it was, it was, it was confusing to people and, and had a kind of propagandistic value because it actually conflated these two uh, things. The locations within the relations of domination, exploitation, and production, locations within market relations, job slash occupations. So it's like, oh, like, because it used to be the case, like, if you entered a country and you declared your job, your occupation on the on the customs form or whatever, uh, the immigration form or customs form, many people would just write capitalist as their job on the form. But that, that has become so much less clear over the course of the 20th century into the 21st century. Uh, and yeah, it's like, oh yeah, I have a a position within relations of domination exploitation as an owner but i also i also draw a salary so right. like i kind of have like 
the ethos of work and I can I can take on that persona of a worker in some way uh, because yeah it, it, it's like things that used to be a little bit more conceptually and uh, just like um, positionally separated uh, have become more conflated and yeah. it doesn't mean that like this in the abstract does not hold, but it does kind of screw with people's understanding because their theory is a little bit more bifurcated than uh, than reality is. Right. Now, see, also owning a house with a bank loan is somehow treated as owning productive capital in the clear. See, also, I mean, there's there's a lot right. of yeah. But yeah. No, but this is this is why you do simplify things and why you do like conceptual surgery on phenomena that appear to you together. That's a, mm -hmm. actually sort of a virtue of the, you know, analytical kind of aspect is to carve things up. It's just that you gotta remember that that's what you're doing because, and for the reasons that Kyle said even, like as capitalism becomes more complex and we enter, you know, the glorious higher stage of full capitalism, um, we, um, it's like, Relations between market locations and relations uh, locations within relations of domination, exploitation, production, you know, they really like are much more, it's much more diffuse. It's a lot less one-to-one. -one. You can't write yeah. capitalist as your job. Like, it, it, you know, like worker as your, you know, I don't know. No one I don't wrote know. Worker this makes me want to go full like classical Frankfurt school and just start screaming about totality to the high heaven, even though I know that's not necessarily <laughs> like <laughs> helpful because well, because yeah. like the tendency to cut is in of itself a choice. And if you study classical economic, like current neoclassical economics, they hide so much shit in the cuttery, like deliberate. Some ways I cannot think that it, that it is not deliberate because they'll like, I agree two or more parsimonious assumptions that are one of which is like capitalism is always rational because rational is whatever we say it is. Um, because we have two tautological definitions hidden in our parsimonious chart here. They were um, this shit as well, Derek. Yeah. I, I guess the, the question is, is this a problem with the activity of cutting or is that a problem with the specific cuts being made in neoclassical economics? I would argue the, the latter. The, the, I would argue that the activity of cutting necessitates hiding. Well, you know, I that, would agree with that. That's the that's purpose it. of doing the cutting. Yes, that's absolutely. Oh shit! It's Heidegger. Every <laughs> revealing is also a concealing. <laughs> yes, but abstraction is good if you want to understand a complex social system. That's if correct. You can't abstract, you can't fit it in your brain because you're not like uh, because you're one not the you know understand. AI from the end of history. One can never understand the totality without artificially carving it up, right? But that no. doesn't mean. You have to move straight back to the relations after you carve from the abstractions and look at the individual mm -hmm. component and then look at the relation. That's what Marx is doing in right. capital. Like he, he breaks down into separate individual bits and builds out from there. But like what you find in econ uh, in, in neoclassical stuff is that there's just huge amounts of ideological like abstraction and ignoring and never talking about the relation, you know, and it yeah, can't or, be anything but a, 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 an ideological move. Or like literally defining the relation to where it is, where it is irrelevant. Like rationality is defined as whatever people do, because what you do is definitionally rational. Yeah. Just, just pure like, tautologies, tautologies that don't look at the root cause or anything, you know? Right. I mean, and yeah. I, I do think like in this sense, abstraction is necessary. Also like, Hegelian dialectus is not guilty of non abstractification. Like, it's not like, it's not like, <laughs> it's not like if you read Science of Logic, you don't get abstractions. In fact, if anything, it's worse. But yes. the, the, um, the, the, the problem that I have here is that, is that you do have to have a kind of critical relationship to your own methodology that I think. E, uh, e. O. Wright, which is why I still respect him, he's one of the analytical Marxists that I wouldn't send to the gulag, um, attempts to have Good. by constantly undermining his own models. Like, because yeah. he does in this book. Like, he's constantly undermining his own models. Um, where, whereas um, a lot of the, the, the analytic Marxists, they don't. And they get they become more and more just standard neoclassical economistic people over time because of it. 
Yeah, um, there, essentially within analytical Marxism, there was a sort of struggle between the emergentist, you know, the emergentist sort of school in various ways. There's not really, a, you know, it's not really a school, but it's like a tendency. And then what was called rational choice Marxism, which was much more hyper fixated on using game theory. And not that that's a problem. The problem is, is that they only wanted to talk about individuals without being able to scale up. Yeah, and, it was, it was, uh, right. It was methodological individualism in the extremists to the point. So that you El couldn't yeah. Elster and Romer to the point where like later on in, in Jan Elster's career, he has to admit after he's a Marxist, of course, uh, he has to admit that you actually can't do this. <laughs> and so while within analytical Marxism at the time, the methodological individualists seemed to win in social science as a whole, especially as, you know, this, I think this is related to the sort of Cold War climate of social science. As the Soviet Union became less and less of a threat, it was more and more acceptable to do emergent to social science. I actually do kind of buy that there was a political angle to that. And um, so as social science progresses, emergence is just fucking fine because it's not associated with the doctrine of your Cold War enemy. We're so also got a feedback loop there. A fee yeah. Another feedback loop. I also think like the, the, the fact that they, they later on started dealing with the fact that individuals can be explained in aggregate um, as opposed to just a hypothesized collective really does clarify things. Um, and that's Pirowski is like kind of the, uh, a dialectical, I may add, all that causes his own problems way out of this problem. Um, but anyway, are we done? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I just wanted to say that, like, that undermining you were talking about is, like, actually what we see him doing in the previous slide uh, before the, yeah. the diagram we just looked at, which that's, is, you know, that's that's good dialectical practice. <laughs> yep. Okay, let's uh, move But, uh, yeah, let's go. Let's move it on. Um, yeah, so we're on the final, uh, final two slides now. American class structure. Okay, so... Let's have a few points here on the state of the American class structure. The labor movement enabled unionized workers in those jobs to acquire income and security similar to the credentialed middle class. So this is talking about this golden era, I presume, of American um, uh, American economy. Historically, had one of the largest middle classes among the developed world, uh, among the developed countries. Like, do you know what's very interesting? Like, very telling. If you go look at historical Gini calculations, you go back to like the late 60s. Do you know which of the two most equal countries in the world? Ahead of Sweden. Soviet right? Union and the and United States of America. Sorry, sorry capitalist, capitalist country, sorry. Um, was the UK and America. They were more <laughs> wow. wow. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the 50s actually does make third worldism seem legitimate. It just only lasts for 10 years. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. So, like, that is kind of staggering. Like, you, to drive around the UK and to think it was one of the most equal, that it was, like, it was somehow, like, Scandinavia equivalent now is impossible to believe. I was yeah, that is gobsmacked. Hard. Yeah. But that's 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 the that's the historical genie stuff. Okay. Okay. Um, the labor movement never organized more than about 35% of the non-managerial labor force. Yep. That comes up in a bunch of different people who are from the analytic tradition and also communization theorists. Yeah. This is the internal limit of the workers' movement in end notes. Um. The, okay, the educational system organized that the poor receive vastly inferior quality. Uh, sorry. Educational system organized such that the poor receive vastly inferior quality than the middle to upper classes. Why the hell do we pro we do it by zip code and property tax? Duh. <laughs> yeah, that's actually that's th that is very shocking to a European person. That is like no joking. Like that, I don't know any European country that your schools taxes are based on your local taxes. That is just that is kind of like if when you say that to people in, in like in Europe, they. They just cannot believe that is the case, you know. Well, it's an outgrowth of the strict racial segregation of redlining. It's, I'm, it's, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Did I say uh, internal? I meant external limit of the workers' movement. It's the external limit right. from before. 
Anyway, it's, it's, it's an outgrowth, it's it's an outgrowth of, of redlining, but it's also, it's not just that, because it was, even states that didn't have significant minority populations still did the exact same thing. There's only like three states that even mitigate property tax as the basis for their, uh, for their educational inputs. And so we can explain that somewhat in terms of race, but you can't explain it totally in terms of race. And it's because I think they realized pretty quickly with the racial examples that you could also keep poor people down with it pretty effectively. Yeah. Okay. And the U.S. class structure characterized by the highest rates of poverty and economic marginality of any comparable country. Like that's that's Did current. You? But not today, today, yeah, yeah not today. yeah, exactly. Today, yeah. not not in the fifties, yeah. Although yeah. I would add that, like, you you do have to not include China because their geo their Gini coefficient and their rural poverty is higher. But our India, so you have to you have to accept that the that the comparable countries to the United States is Europe and and East Asian small nations and not not actual nations of similar size which is India and China as well, which are normally bracketed out of these comparisons. That's yeah. the only caveat I would add. Um, yeah. Like I would if, say if also- If anything, the outlier is the UK. Mm. Mm. I, would, I would say that the, as well, like the ones you're talking about, India and China are still like largely peasant societies. India is a still a- Still a peasant society. We're, China's probably 50 50 now, is it? It's less than that. It's like 48, it's like 40 60 now, but it, it's still really high for, for a country that is as developed as it is. Yeah. So um, it's like, I think a lot of that in like, uh, like as in, we, we, I don't know. I don't know what I was going to say. I'd like, I, I kind of imagine that it might come down in China as they become maybe less peasant, have that strict divide where places like the US and the UK have got. No goddamn excuse. <laughs> you know? It's like it's like a different process that their genie seems to be there, but maybe not. Maybe it's all interlinked. Um, I would be interested. It'd be interesting to see what the how the how that works in China with their uh, uh, rising organic composition of capital. What it means going forward. Um, and yeah, politics. India is currently having a minor revolt of peasant smallholders right now. So yeah. Not mm -hmm. even minor, the biggest one in human history, or something. Well, I mean, I mean minor in in the sense that it it's not threatening to fundamentally destabilize the entire. Given how how large the the actual like protest movement is. Yeah, did they have something like? Was it something like two hundred? It's, like, it's two, like a quarter billion people, or something like that, yeah, or, or like, like somehow involved in this. Yeah, two hundred fifty million or something. Yeah, um, oh, almost know. the entirety of the United States. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so wild. It's uh -huh. like, oh yeah, how many multiples of the entire population of Canada is that? Okay. I know. Yeah. It's like it's like literally, uh, it's like literally a hundred times Irish population are out in the streets. <laughs> yeah, and it's still not even a plurality of India. It's like I know. Yeah, India. Uh, th 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 that's like a really just bizarre thing to think about in the sense that like like what if india like didn't have a national movement and didn't become a single country i mean i guess it didn't but like mostly one country right like would you get a, a quarter billion people joining in a single protest movement that nope. is yeah, so like no, you'd you'd be looking at like five to six dozen distinct countries in the Indian subcontinent if, if there yes. wasn't a national movement. Yeah, yes. That yeah. created base a national movement created by colonialism, basically. Like, yes. Yeah. 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 No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's the dialectic. We're gonna to have to move on. Let's uh, go. <laughs> no, finally, intensified by enduring racism. Y yeah, duh. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah, about Wait, that. That, right, G, I mean, that that genie coefficient during the fifties, hmm. That you know who wasn't? Like, yeah, you know who wasn't getting that? Yeah. yeah actually, yeah. okay. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna point out because uh, the reeds actually do have good stats on this. They still the the black community still relative to its historical standard got more of it than you than it's presented now as getting, just not as much as white people. Um, it, which is why actually the black community's big period of derationalization is the 70s and then the worst is actually the worst period of loss of black wealth is the last 10 years mostly yes. in the obama yes. administration 
Yep. So. Yeah. Yep. Mostly because mostly because the 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 biggest burden of the 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 home ownership crisis of the last you know 10, 15 years was the mm-hmm. was pretty specifically like the black community because they were the sort of like last into the the home ownership market and they got the brunt of the shittiest loan deals. Right. And when the Obama administration refused to bail out homeowners and instead uh, bailed out the uh, the home lenders, uh, the the black community was hit the hardest by it. Right. And I, I've actually pointed this out to people who who like talk about, you know, class people never have an answer to racial problems. And I'm like, well, I don't know. Slavery and Jim Crow removed you from the ability to participate in what eight to 10 generations of wealth accumulation. And then you got screwed in the two generations you were allowed to participate in wealth generation by getting hit the hardest by the last housing bubble because the housing markets where we put all of our freaking wealth. So like you just got doubly screwed. And, but you know, since it was done with, with intersectional posturing, you guys won't criticize that. I don't know. Maybe class does explain what's happening to black people a little bit. Um, right. And to your point about the, uh, the, the black communities in the fifties, I mean, think about like the Harlem Renaissance and uh, black wall street. Like these are, um, these are our regions within like the, the black America that experienced pretty massive economic booms. It was just not, um, it was just not as big relative to the the white working class, the the white America, essentially. Although the Harlem Renaissance was earlier, right? But yeah, Har- know, Harlem but, Renaissance yeah. and Black and Black Wall Street is actually er- earlier than that. There is the revitalization of Black communities in the fifties, but again, like it was still, it was still very slow and anemic compared to white America. That's, I think that's where you have to zone in to explain what happened. The, the, the breakdown was not equal, but if you look at like benefits across the board, I think the people that you could say were totally excluded is actually indigenous. Cause they were just to- like, that's like the high point of indigenous getting messed up. Yeah. That's kind of, that is actually sort of what I was thinking about when I was saying that. So, I mean, yeah, I could, I could accept that rising tide lifts all boats when it comes to black America during the fifties. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I almost threw up. Yeah, um, but but with indigenous communities, that's just. I mean, if we were talking about the original sin of primary accumulation in the United States, we we know what that's about. Well, I, I I saw recently a couple of episodes of Lovecraft Country, and you know, you see the black neighborhoods there; they look really nice in the 1950s, and the the clothes they're wearing are so fashionable; they all look great. That's what I think. That's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm sure that's what the show was was trying to trying to put forward. I don't know. I haven't seen Love. I haven't seen Lovecraft Country. It's it's a shit show. Let's. It's a shit show of a shit show. Okay. Now. Oh God. Uh, burp, burp, burp. Okay. Finally, we're on the. This is the final one. The challenges. Yes. The challenges of an integrated class analysis. First of all, we're hit with this point. Marxists sometimes claim that the mantle. Sorry. Marxists sometimes claim the mantle of a comprehensive paradigm of social science, defended with the rhetoric incomment with, with the rhetoric of increment sorry, defended with the rhetor- with the re- rhetoric of incommensurable paradigms. Um, I think this this point has been so influential on me. There's a there's a paragraph from the beginning of the chapter that I, I would like to read. Can I read the paragraph? Uh what, when I as began long as we writing, don't start the chapter over, yeah. Right, right. Um, when I began writing about class in the mid-1970s, I saw Marxism as a comprehensive paradigm confronting positivist social science. Uh, this is page one, just the first page of the book after the preface. While I argued that this battle should be engaged on empirical as well as theoretical terrain, I viewed Marxism and mainstream sociology as foundationally distinct and incommensurable warring paradigms. Looking back in the mid eighties at this earlier work, I wrote, I originally had visions of glorious paradigm battles with lances drawn and the valiant Marxist knight unseating the bourgeois rival in a dramatic quantitative joust. What is more, the fantasy saw the vanquished admitting defeat and changing horses as a result. Um, And so, you know, eventually, Let's see. Um, Nearly four decades have passed. I just want to add a 
a small addendum to that, which is that this uh, idea of uh, intellectual change would not really be that implausible uh, in, say, the 60s. Because sure. you had seen something like the institutionalists in America, which were previously the dominant school of economics, unseated in exactly this manner by the neoclassicals. Uh, so, like, this... The, it, it's not to say that this kind of paradigm shift does not happen. It does. It's just it didn't. It didn't happen there. And it and like uh, Eric Olin writes other points about Marxism not being actually that distinct. Uh, maybe totally valid. I'm just saying it's yeah. not as silly as he makes it sound. Uh, no, no, no. I, I, I mean, yeah. If if I have a lot of sympathy for where that generation of scholars are coming from, but I think that his sobriety about this is like a well-worn lesson of those times, you know, and like the idea totally. of this would be a heroic, you know, fact finding jousting match, which will dethrone bourgeois sociology and establish Marx Marxist class analysis, you know, is displacing all those other mechanisms. And, I also want to say that this yeah. is exactly what actually happened in reverse to Marxists in many parts of the world with the fall of uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the the Soviet Union. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, so, yeah, these things happen. They're just not the way that he envisioned. Yeah. But so, yeah, you right. Expect them, you certainly wouldn't expect them to happen, like, you know, in, for somebody who was like, you know, like a Marxist analysis is going to win the battle in, in a bourgeois uh, scientific environment, even if they were right. You would never like you would, you would never expect them to override override the superstructure. You wouldn't expect that, but there, there, um, Kyle, isn't there like a whole tradition of like historiography in Japan that was essentially dominated by Marxists, even though it was capitalist? Yeah, it's because of special circumstances. Uh, so, like, mm -hmm. first of all, Marx was the only person because of the theory of. Uh, uh, modes of production to have a a kind of like historically variegated understanding of progression uh, or of development, uh, which is why Weberian sociology became a thing in the United States because they were like, oh no, we need development theory mm -hmm. to fight the Marxists uh, explicitly. Right. Uh, uh, and so that was attractive to the Japanese in the way that other theories were not. The other thing that we have to, to remember is that Japan was one of those border countries between the state socialist world and the capitalist world, which allowed there for there to be like two parallel forms of, of the academy. But you're absolutely right that like in the early pre-World War okay. II period, uh, um, even when Japan was firmly capitalist, not surrounded by uh, socialist states, uh, because of that sort of like, well, where do we fit into this picture question? Marx was uh, very uh, attractive and influential to everyone and not just, you know, hardcore labor activists. Yeah, I was about to say, even in the United States, in historiography proper, not, not in sociology, in historiography proper, Marxism is still considered the most advanced but failed form of historiography and there's nothing that has quote unquote risen to replace it. I mean, it, you know, it wasn't even hard for Heidegger to say that. So like, mm -hmm. the, in fact, if you think about it from even Tom's point of view, granting, granting your opponent legitimacy, but then saying, well, we don't have anything to replace it, but they still fail. But look how awesome what they, they, they had tried to do is, but look, it destroyed the world. So we just, we shouldn't try this at all um, is a pretty useful rhetorical technique. Right. Well, um, yeah, I, to just sort of circle back to the, the ultimate point here is that like integrating Marxist stuff into good science essentially is the only way you're ever going to get like this kind of class analysis to be taken seriously, not just in America, but now I'm thinking about the ex communist countries where they had this grand paradigm battle in the exact reverse way to which, you know, right thought it was gonna happen. 
So like the only way you're ever going to get this stuff back in vogue in a way that isn't totally fucking reactionary um, would be to actually integrate it into the body of social science. It's just, it's just the only way that that's going to happen. And Wright lays out a, what he calls a virtue centric synthesis. Basically, you know, you look at what different class analyses do right and try to systematize from there. Um, so yeah, I think, I, I just, I just think this is, you know, we've been talking a lot about dialectics, so-called, but like, I think the difference between, you know, lowercase d, like dialectics in the Marxist sense that isn't exactly Hegelian dialectics or blah, 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 whatever, like the good virtuous sense of dialectics is its ability to bring together a lot of conflicting tendencies. And the bad thing about capital D dialectics is that it's supposed to be this comprehensive paradigm that shuts out and, you know, closes its ears la, 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 to all the other like tendencies and thought. Um, which again, big D dialectics carries the stamp of cold war ideology through and through. Whereas, you know, the previous notion has something to do with good scientific practice. Like, and I, I find the whole anti-dialectics framing really dodgy because it's inevitably we're going to move between these two notions of dialectics. Mm -hmm. So like at this point, emergent social science means a lot of the things Marx was getting at in, you know, dialectics is part like those kinds of feedback loops. It's part of how people do social science now. It's not always well done, but it's there. We don't need a special methodology to get there anymore. If, you know, if that was ever really a useful thing. I don't know. I, I still think it's a useful thing because I, I, I still see where this goes, Esri. I think, you, I think you're, you're too soft and you're right. Um, I mean, the methodological nationalism thing leads directly into the trap we're going to get into at the end of this book. Yeah. Like, the yeah. There's a bunch trap. of, there's a bunch of traps. Trap. There's a bunch of trap. Yeah, the trap. Yeah, trap. The, there's the, a bunch of traps. Capital trap too. The like not being able to talk about value relations, and you know what. But again, that's an emergentist tendency in a capitalist economy. I have respect for E.O. Wright because you know he was a sociologist defending the existing labor theory of value in public, then realized that literature is garbage. You could be a TSSI person or a value form person and basically agree. I would say. Oh no, I had a point, it's gone. Derek, did you want to say something? You know, oh no, I, oh, yeah. I have a point, sorry. Um, I would say as well, it's like, it's not like Marx didn't situate capital firmly within like classical political economy. That mm -hmm. the fact that your your research or stuff is kind of integrated into whatever, even if it's goddamn quantum physics. Yeah, it's like the, the fact that if you have like a Marxist or dialectical approach, like, it should, it's not a problem that you're sitting in bourgeois science. Just simply cannot, you cannot exclude yourself from it. Marx didn't I, I think, any reason for it. I think what we're actually talking about is the negative dynamics of a stalemate. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, where the tendency towards partisanship um, sort of like, you know, goes sour. And uh, everything becomes internally referential to the paradigm. Right. Um, and that's because of the stalemate. And the way out was to lose for the Marxists. Yeah. Uh, Seriously, which, yeah, it was. Which, which, had, yeah. which had positive intellectual consequences in some ways because it actually removed those dilemmas of being stuck in a stalemate and all of like that weird cult shit that was said in it um, mm -hmm. because I don't think we can take, I don't think we can look. So speaking as somebody who has studied a lot of intellectual history, which is a weird discipline, but I think it has like one thing that's useful to look at is that partisanship in intellectual endeavors is just like endemic to what intellectual endeavors are. And 
it's not necessarily self-destructive. But I think in the Cold War situation, you got into that stalemate where it did become self-destructive. Um, and then, yeah, like, as you're saying, Ezri, like, actually the collapse of the Marxist paradigm uh, did give way to room through systems theory and cybernetics for emergentist theories to become mainstream. So that was yeah. like a positive outcome of that defeat. Yeah, it's the strange victory of dialectics. The, the dialectics victory. of defeat, you might say. <laughs> um, so yeah, well, we should we should we should go another through book the... we should read one day. Um, That'd be next fun. Point. Next point. Let's move it on. Um, Marxism's power. Oh, blah, 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 blah. sorry, we did that one, didn't we? Uh, kind of. Oh, we, we didn't read it out loud, but I'll read it out loud. Marxism's power comes from its ability to provide powerful explanations for an array of phenomena, not because it is epistemologically unique. That is something yeah. I believe deeply. I think that that it should be a duh. It should be a duh, but it is very much not. I know. Well, I, I know, but this I is basically a suck it Trotsky. Like, it's, <laughs> like yes, this is what it is. To, to the entire Leninist tradition, like more or less, like yeah. Uh, well, well, weirdly, Maoists actually don't claim ep uh, ep epistemic uniqueness to Marxism in the same way that mo most Soviet Leninists do. Um, That's whether or not they're, whether or not I, they're. I, I, I mean, I got the sense from Mao's own writings that they would have every reason to. Not in the same way, no. I mean, like, that's why Mao's own writings read like folk religion, though, because they avoid making epistemic claims. Well, they're so unlike their Maoists. They're so un they're so unlike their Mao, I suppose. Yeah, but even uh, even when you even when you read contemporary Maoists, like, what what do they do to justify? Like, J. Paul Mafad, how does he justify his weird immortal science claims? It's a mixture of Soviet stuff, and then like actual appears to weird bourgeois stuff. Like, he goes into Popper as somehow proving Marx. Which I mean, but I've hilarious. I've also I've also read like some <laughs> incredibly bong rip Maoism. Like I, I've I've I know I but I've I've read some I don't know I I think this might be less true of Maoists, but I don't think it's universally true of Maoists because I've seen bong Maoists does claim mean, that doesn't mean I've, like epistemic uniqueness. It j also could be just insane because but but. but but I've seen the epistemic uniqueness argument from Maoists, so it probably depends on your, you know, th thirty-seven flavors of Maoists or whatever. Right. Well, I mean, that's like, true for for any of these, right? I mean, like Trotsky has had the Cliffite tradition, which gave up on dialectics. Like, um, but using the, Popper to 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 back up your like Marx's claims, given that Popper used his claims to destroy Marx's <laughs> claims, that is quite that's quite the turnaround. It's yeah. probably dialectical. But um, JMP do be do that. But I mean I, I, I do I do just want to say that like uh uh epistemically unique is a possible definition of insanity. Uh, yeah. so, <laughs> they're not necessarily distinct. Well I just you know what did this Welcome to critical this theory. Be that I think Yara and the and the scripts goes to and also Marx himself talked about is Marx is highly dependent on neoclassical economics, French, French political theory, and um, classical economics. Classical economics. Yeah, classical economics, excuse me. Uh, that's a mistake on my part. Uh, French political theory and... Um, chartism. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, British chartism. Yeah. Or and, German uh, philosophy, British, are you talking about? Yeah, and German idealist philosophy with, the, with this big caveat that like Marx also, like, his epistemic theory is basically Aristotle. Like, it really mm -hmm. is. Like, it's Aristotle plus Hegel. It's a Hegelian yeah. understanding of Aristotle. And, like, and if you don't get that, there's all kinds of claims Marx makes that doesn't make sense. But he's not claiming epistemic uniqueness. Like, he's really not. And, and even Engels isn't claiming epistemic uniqueness. He's claiming, like, a total field theory of science. But, like... <laughs> Like he doesn't say we have the right epistemology, our theory of knowledge. He says dialectics allows us to reach certain. I mean, I guess in some ways it's functionally the same thing, but yeah, it's... like by the time by the time he's doing like metaphysics and calling it science, you know, there's like a whole series of conflations, and I think epistemology is one of those links. But yeah, well, I, I know what you're saying. That's not how they argue it. Okay, next point. 
these points are taking 25 minutes apiece. They um, are, Viberian, aren't they? They're good ones. Viberian sociologists have not inspired, uh, have not aspired to create a comprehensive paradigm satisfied with the rich menu of loosely connected concepts and addressing specific empirical and historical problems. Bing, 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 they're pragmatist, which right. is why I don't trust cash value thought. <laughs> What's the cash value of not trusting cash value thought? He's looking at somebody there, but I'm not sure who. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's Kyle. <laughs> I, like, I just like saying cash value because it upsets Marxists. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, pragmatism is really interesting, but it does always, I don't know, it does always, it's, you also get into varieties of pragmatism. And, you know, yeah. Well, uh, well Perth was a Hegelian pragmatist, which is crazy fun, but like, yeah. Pragmatist, pragma, pragmatism in general was considered. It comes um, out of Hegel, out of yeah. Hegel for sure. One hundred percent, it comes out. Of Hegel. <laughs> yeah, it was considered like crypto Hegelianism essentially. Uh, well, so but no, of... like even Dewey was not crypto. Dewey was just a Hegelian because that was the <laughs> normal thing to be in the U.S. at the time because it was a way to be kind of Christian, but also kind of not. Yeah, and, I was about to say, yeah, all yeah. the transcendentalists are all like, th that's Hegelian mysticism for idiots. Like... Oh, yeah. You mean Americans? I don't know. I just know that I'm allergic to, to pragmatism because all of the like <laughs> self-identified neoliberals that I know call right. themselves pragmatists and they're they like everything that we believe, we believe because because it is pragmatic and empirically backed and all this like other well, ideas. I mean, and that's the bullshit. problem with with uh, pragmatism except in purse is is it, it mm -hmm. cash value is a circular concept. <laughs> Yeah, like, no, what is useful you, is what I think is useful. So eugenics as 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 you know, eugenics as uh pragmatism. Uh it, it, there's a read uh Louis Minan's history of the transcendentalist and protagonist, the American what is it, the uh metaphysical club. Uh, eugenics actually is rooted, has a pragmatist mm -hmm. argument behind it entirely. Completely. Um, yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, so I mean it, it it should be noted that. Wright calls himself a pragmatic or a pragmatist realist, essentially, when it comes to his philosophy of science. So this is all relevant. This is all relevant to why we might be skeptical walking into Wright and hearing himself call himself some kind of pragmatist. Yeah, but, pragmatist so realist sounds like Dewey. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. means so, bourgeois traitor. No. Um. Yes, yes. No, <laughs> Get no, out the so, knives! <laughs> that's, that's definitely what I want people to take away from this, is that, well, I, I, well what he <laughs> said seems interesting, but then he used the wrong adjective to describe himself, so we have to kill him. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm pretty sure that tradition is alive and well, even outside of Marxism on the left. <laughs> You see, yeah. you know, like we've chosen like a, a text that we end, we, we I think we all kind of disagree with in the end. So we're going to have so many gulag references in thirty-two goddamn episodes that are projected. <laughs> let's be let's be clear about this. There's going to be a lot of times where we where we call him a traitor. What, uh, funny, it's it. funny about uh, right though to defend him just a little bit while I'm while I'm calling him a bourgeois traitor. Um, is I did this book opened up an array for uh, problems for me that other books we've even discussed on this on this uh, uh, like I don't know when I read uh, what is it the, the McNair text and the Kleiman text for the third times those were both my third times reading through I I got way madder at them than in, in either of the first two times the, this is my third time reading this and I'm like eh, I was right. Like I feel pretty much the same about it as the first time. This first three chapters are, are blew my mind and and led me down to really creative things to deal with about reconciling Burdu, which which I think E.O. Wright just reads wrong, for example, and and, and other and other theorists of, of class with Marxism that I thought was helpful and in a way that you could defend Marxism. Um, but by the end of the book, I still kind of am like, but you're still a traitor. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, no, there's. It's going no, to be there's... tough on you, Esri. It's going to be tough on you. You know what, though? It's not, because I engaged with analytical Marxism as a sort of, like, black pill, and I was very upset. I was trying to figure out how dialectics, you know, and dialectical thought could be marshaled to defend precious prejudices, and I couldn't defend it. 
And so engaging with the analytical Marxists being very upset with their conclusions made me think, okay, I have two options here if I want to maintain my convictions. It's either I assert a whole different epistemology or I have to accept some of the premises that the analytical Marxists are putting forward and not others. And I find one of these strategies much more effective for, you know, argue, not only arguing my point to others, but to asking myself, do I really believe that these convictions have any referent in the real world? Or am I just, am I just essentially religious? Is this just like a, an exercise in, well, I believe something. So even if it's impossible, I don't care, you know, like, well, yeah. what, what about, what about these convictions means anything? Uh, yeah. I, well, I mean, that's the whole point of this enemy, uh, enemy camp series, right? It's <laughs> <Well, laughs> uh, a cross pod joke. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, no, yeah. but, uh, you know, like I, I've said this before on other podcasts, but like the way that I got to like socialism was, was that I argued so hard against ANCAPs that I destroyed like the, the little liberal in my head that said, but actually some of their arguments are good. So. Yeah, yeah. actually my mine was dealing with um, paleo conservatives and then also like thinking about John Locke a lot and going, that doesn't make any goddamn sense. Like, like how do you, how, how, how do you justify property off of use when like, you're living through the enclosure period and writing about it at the time, and you're just not lying? Question mark. You know, um, and so you know that's where I, that's how kind of I got here. But to 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 defend Esri to agree with you, like I think I'm more black pilled on Marxism sometimes than you are, even though I'm the person who argues like the most stringently for everybody sticking to their Marxist categories exactly. Because I don't like people trying to use wiggle room to save something that doesn't work. If it's wrong, it's wrong. But um, uh, I do think that, I, I think my problem with analytical Marxism, it has tended to be, it tries to have this both ways to whether or not it's Marxist or not. And, and also a lot of it doesn't end up being true. As you said, what won the analytical Marxist day was ultimately defeated in the general sphere of social science overall. Yep. Yeah, but in a, in a way that like, when you read through the way that the analytical Marxist debates proceed internally gives ammo to the more like orthodox side. Like yeah. that's the interesting thing. And like one of the big, one of the big sticking points is that, oh, like, like in, in all of their like sort of political backs and forth is that, oh, well, you know, the economy's doing fine and you know, labor unions give you good rights. So, I mean, what's the problem? And then, you know, you're reading these texts from 1979 and like the ashes of like class consciousness in 2008. You're like, wow, all their reasons for, you know, like a lot of their, some, you have to pick apart some of their reasons for their more, con you know, conservative political conclusions still hold, but a lot of them don't, <laughs> a lot of them don't anymore. Um, well, like, like for example, Romer defeating equilibrium theory, which even capitalists don't believe in anymore. It's like, right. <laughs> let's move on, but we're going to get stuck in this. So integrated yeah. challenges. Exploitation is not figured centrally in Weberian analysis, but there's no fundamental to including it. Hashtag barrier. lol. Yeah, there's no <laughs> fundamental barrier to including exploitation in Weberian analysis. Lol. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, I found that line very funny. As in, like, <laughs> there's nothing to stop me from being a Marxist except that I'm a bourgeois, <laughs> you know. Um, well, plenty uh, of bourgeois or Marxists. Come on, you know, I'm joking. You know, I'm making a, I'm making a joke. I would just yeah. on the previous points that you were saying. I think there's one thing I'd say is like there was nothing that made the thing that probably made me most like become uh, stop believing in God was the integrate or dealing with like uh, catechism, Catholic actual like the actual teachings of actually what they say. And when you deal with their actual logical arguments, you kind of go, wait, what the fuck? What, what the fuck is this? And I think, you know, getting towards uh, um, what we were talking about, uh, what were we talking about previously? I'm going to shut up. Let's talk about this one. Uh, what is the reason, like, like it, 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 I think this point is, I think this point is kind of a, a really... I, I don't know. It just seems like an incredibly naive point to me on some, on some it, level. Well, yes and no. Like, because, okay, so for, I think the two points kind of go together, right? It's like, Weberian sociologists do not have a comprehensive paradigm 
and also do not think about exploitation. <laughs> mm. uh, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, maybe this is actually a core thing that's like anchoring the social fabric. Um, but uh, yeah, like I think it's it's like, I guess what we're doing here in terms of talking about like, oh yeah, like, you know, private property rights are a special form of the Viberian case. Um, it's not like you can't logically do that. Uh, I think if you were a sociologist who was being trained and uh, trained in the existing academy and looking for a job, you probably wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> but <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's like, yeah, like, there's no, I, I don't know if I would say fundamental is the correct word to use there. It's like there's like no logical barrier to doing it, right? Yeah, but there is a fundamental barrier. To yes, doing it. yes, 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 exactly. Which is getting a job and having academic success. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's the barrier. Which it's might actually make sense from a Weberian perspective <laughs> of that opportunity hoarding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, don't want those yokels, those proles. <laughs> Only the traitor proles, please. No, there it is. Like, I don't know. I think that, like, he can do a lot of damage to Viberian sociology by creating a neo-Marxism that incorporates all of Viberian sociology with an underlying exploitation mechanism. Yeah, like, it seems to me that, like, it's not so much that Marx doesn't deal with these Weberian schemes much, but that it's just not his central focus, that they come in on the edges. There are parts, I think, where like some of, uh, you know, this opportunity hoarding type stuff is intrinsically incorporated, you know, and maybe throw, you know, a sentence here and there is thrown to it. But Marx was looking at the exploitation as the fundamental driver of these things. It's not like I don't look at Weber and Weber's idea of opportunity hoarding and go, I say no to that. That's not Marxism. I just kind of go like, you know, this is like, a, um, you know, just a, a, a component. Uh, I just think that, that that it just slots in kind of without any problems. I don't see, I don't see any issue with incorporating it. I don't know if I'm missing something, but like what other people reckon? Well, at the, at the end of the chapter here, um, Eo Wright Mar uh, writes, Marxism remains a distinctive tradition of doing social science because uh, of its distinctive set of problems, its normative foundations, and its distinctive inventory uh, concepts and mechanisms that it has de uh, deployed. And I think that's that's generally true. Like, you know, what we were saying before about it not being epistemically unique, it's that it is it is unique in, in what it chooses to 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 look at and the uh some of the the methodological choices that it uses to look at them uh and you know adding in different uh adding in a different focus doesn't necessarily fundamentally change like it being a it, it an analysis coming out of the marxist tradition to incorporate sort of a a, a Weberian lens on what you're actually seeing yeah, like when I actually have discussions with people about the role of like professionals and managers in society, what they're always afraid of is that I'm arguing the PMC thesis or something. And it's like, no, 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 no. We can account for these things in reality without, you know, without asking, without, without like short circuiting and stopping ourselves from asking the fundamental questions Marxists are asking. Like, there's no contradiction there. It's like a, it's like some kind of academic culture war. It's, I, there's an ideological block to doing this. Like, yeah, we just have to be pragmatically real about it, right? No, 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 no. If, dentists, if, if, dentists are not doctors, I will say that. and doctors aren't dentists. <laughs> Fuck you guys. <laughs> well, like, I, if this is what pragmatic realism is, sure. I don't know if I would describe it as that, but if that's what it, if that's what it is, then fucking fine. Like we can't, 
Like, you just can't say that the Viberian stuff doesn't matter. Like a lot of Marxists want to. Mm. And if you do that, you look like a fucking moron because are people today like in America super concerned, like for the most part about how exploited they are? No, they're usually uh, like concerned with how exploited they're not. Like, please, I need some exploitation. I need to pay for things in my life. And the only way I can do it right now is to, you know, get this, get this job. For Joe Biden! <laughs> That's really like, like, please, I need a job. Like, uh, yeah, the only thing worse than being exploited under capitalism is not being exploited under capitalism. Yeah, Joan Robinson. Yeah. Right. Are, like, are, get, are getting shot and slaughtered in the face by capitalism. Well, there's yeah. that too. But. Well, there's <laughs> yeah, that okay. too. But we, we're talking after the, you know, this is. We're talking know, 1950s here. Right, <laughs> right. right. <laughs> um, uh, all right, but just to say one last thing about pragmatism, I, I think that the, the biggest issue is that the vast majority of people who call themselves pragmatists are basically just like obscuring the fact that they're not uh, challenging or acknowledging like the ideology and the ideological assumptions that are underlying everything that they do. So if someone wants to call themselves a pragmatist and actually like um, explicates their ideological assumptions and like, you know, brings those uh, into their arguments in a way that you can obviously see that they are at least grappling with it at some level. I'm not that, that I don't really have that big of an issue with it, but like pragmatism is, is often just a way to say like, Oh, you know, I, or like, I'm not being political here or, you know, that, that, that's not even like the way in which he means pragmatism. He's talking about a specific sort of methodological tradition. Yeah, Most I, 99 I, times out of a hundred people like I'm a pragmatist is just like, you know, yuppie business speak for I'm effective. I don't let my brain get in the way of success. Like, right. Right. No. And I was, I was just saying that that's why I'm not yeah. really, I don't really have that big of an issue with it being yeah. here. It's just, it's just, you know, I do have an allergy to it because 99% of the time that's what pragmatism means. Yes. Yeah. I think, uh, so, um, well, there's a few things like, first of all, we have to remember that Dewey defended Trotsky uh, against uh, <laughs> being yeah. persecuted by the American <laughs> state. Uh, yeah. uh, like Dewey was pretty friendly to Marxists, even though he didn't agree with them entirely. Uh, um, I think there are some fundamental differences of concern between Marxism and pragmatism where doing pragmatism tends to lead you into I guess it's just it's not exactly idealism but like the uh, but like uh, lots of focus on epistemology, lots of focus on how do we know things, Lots of focus on like, well, what are our concepts really and how do they connect to action and how does that connect to democracy, um, which is like tangentially related to all the concerns of Marxism, but they don't, it's like Marxists, Marxists and pragmatists tend to look at different things, but it doesn't mean they're necessarily opposed to each other. <laughs> I would say that I've listened to hundreds of hours of Chomsky lectures in my time. Um, Chomsky's not a pragmatist, is he? He quotes Dewey all the time. Oh, yeah. You know, he quotes Dewey, and you know who else he quotes all the time? Is, oh my God, I got the book on here. The Limits to State Action by, what's your man's name? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt. Oh, yeah. So, like, Chomsky probably only ever mentions Marx uh, in kind of an argument with a Marxist, essentially. Yeah, he has nothing positive to say about Marx, yeah. Yeah, he's he's pretty pretty anti-Marxist. Like, um, he's not anti, he's anti-Marxists, but he's not anti-Marx when they actually get into discussing yeah. Marx. That's the way I would put it. Well, yeah, yeah but, but he, he also doesn't... He doesn't I, draw on Marx much at all 
I guess is what I would say. Yeah, nearly never. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, he, he doesn't. He doesn't actually engage with like uh, Marxist theory at all. He's he's engaging at the level of like Marxist people. Yes, and also he actually really goes against Hegel against Hegel. You know, yeah. actually quotes Hegel, which is later. very funny. But very never funny Marx. given his uh, his his uh, love affair with Dewey. Uh, I mean, Dewey Dewey claimed to be like post Hegelian because of his of the influence of Darwin on his thought. Like he thought that Darwin gave him a way to break out of the Hegel idealism uh, trap. But um, I think there's a lot of Dewey that's still pretty damn Hegelian. Uh, so yeah, it's okay. yeah. It if I were to say just two things here is that, yes, uh, pragmatists are more focused on epistemology. Marxists, when they're not Cold War ideologues, are more focused on, you know, like the structuring of class ultimately. And of course, their normative commitments, which a lot of pragmatists don't have, um, and a lot of Marxists say they don't have, but they're lying. And then the second thing I'd say is that uh, Chomsky probably isn't interested in Marx because Marxism during his time was essentially marshaled as an argument for why it was cool for Lenin to destroy the councils, which is what he considered socialism to be. Chomsky mm -hmm. wrote the, uh, the AK press, um, introduction to, to Anton Panikowicz workers, workers councils. councils. Yeah. 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 And w that famous back and forth between Chomsky and some, you know, frothing at the mouth spart in his audience. Yeah. Um, oh, it's, yeah. just, uh, it's just all about how Lenin destroyed socialism. Lenin destroyed the possibility for the councils to become the basis of, of uh, you know, political and economic decision making. So and there's there's the, there's the idealism in Chomsky and no understanding of actual material. You know, like I mean, seriously, that's like it's such an idealistic attack. It's it's kind of incredible. It's so non-materialist. I, I I don't think I don't think it is. It's just that like obviously because of the existence of Panacoic, you could be a Marxist and think that. Panacook thinks that and is a Marxist. Yeah, but I don't think there. I think like you know, I, uh, you know, uh, like I'm no Leninist. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. But, like, but I don't okay. think you can look at like Lenin's actions outside of the material conditions. And like Chomsky, I don't, that I, essentially I think, makes the point. Like in that in I that argument, in, an, in the, but in that argument, he talks about how Lenin wrote one thing to get people on side for him, and then he reverted quickly back to the right because that was his true nature. Like that's quite. I think a, that's basically right. I think, I, and I, I was, I'm an ex-Leninist. I think that is basically right, and I, I've struggled with that for like a decade. Like, and every like, there's just one period where Lenin is cool, and then he flips back to being his old self. Like, anyway. Oh, I'm, maybe I'm just, maybe you've read more Lenin than me, but I I I'm uh, yeah I I just think I I do think Chomsky has big idealism vibes. That's what I would say overall from listening to literally hundreds of hours of lectures. Oh, yeah, like politically speaking, like yeah, he's yeah. he's much more of like a pra yeah he's much more of one of these pragmatists. Yes, like but he he's got stronger normative commitments than most of them. But yeah, definitely. Well, I'm I'm fully on this cancel communist vibe at the moment, so don't take any of what I'm saying as not. I'm 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 literally going to. I bought a couple of books. I said I would never buy books. Said I would finish that goddamn bookshelf staring down at me, and I <laughs> I relented, and I've gone yeah, and bought three fucking books this week. I feel I feel like I've pancake pilled you. The Swampside fandom has has pancake pilled you. Yeah, That's I was. A, I had that book. Tony Pancake had, is Bay, but but Tom it. Because of your accent, it sounded like you said cancel Marxists or cancel communists. Oh, <laughs> cancel oh yeah, communists. cancel communists. <laughs> and I was just like, Finally. you know what? Maybe I'm not. <laughs> Finally, yeah. I'm a, a Marxist, a, a communism I can get behind. Yeah, yeah. broke, cancel culture, yes. bespoke, cancel, cancel culture. communists. <laughs> <laughs> right then, right. on this note, we'll say goodbye to everybody in the chat. There's a lot of people in there. I'll give a quick look. We got Grimlock, Spectral Theory, Mark Cosby, Electrician Apprentice. Uh, KGB operative, dear God, Yara Mandala, <laughs> Yara Handala, always uh, uh, in the chat, doing good hard work. Mason, Mason Kerr, Grimlock, Doctor Forbin, uh, anybody else in here? Uh, Mark Owen. Um, thanks everybody. Uh, make sure you smash that like button so that people will uh, 
find the video. It's uh, our last live stream did actually a lot of people actually watched it. It was incredible. I couldn't believe it. About five hundred people watched three hours of us talking rubbish. But let's uh, let's leave it for this week. We'll see you either next week or two weeks, depending on the quorum. We'll try for next week and we'll see how we get on. Um, but thanks everybody, and let's do a group um, um, goodbye, shall we? Yeah. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye.